Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon so a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Dal West Watson, Mike, Henrik86, Dick Earth Skeptic, the Flat Earth Channel.com, Chris Hillman, NA Literalist, Maria Neeland, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, Burn Fat Till My Stomach Is As Flat As The Earth, Nathan Ethan Thompson, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Missouri Bear, Liam Nedrick, Dank, Erwin Jennison's, Abraham Mohammed, Dave Rakia Gafford, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, Felix Hung, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, Kirsten Smith, Tina Baker, Alexander Main, and David Wayne Foster. So a massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. So I'm going to raise the mic on whoever the hell is in Discord and G+, and you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. Yeah, Did you so catch my, it early? Did you wife, catch it right when it started? Well, my wife called and was like, what's with the balloons popping? I'm like, uh, it's not balloons popping. Then the circuit breaker went. And I'm like, okay, what, what what's going on? So I turned the circuit breaker back on. It just popped and popped and popped. So I was like, okay, we'll have to wait. Maybe it's overheated. I figured out how many things I had on. It wasn't a great deal of things, number of things. Um, So I waited about five minutes. Turned every single thing in the house off. And then slowly, one by one, turned it back on. When we got to the fridge, it turned on. was going pop, 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 pop. Like shit, turn it up. Turn it back off again quick. So I pulled it out. Turn it, turn it around. And behind it, one of the fuse boards, not fuse boards, one of the... PCBs had just shorted, it was just throwing sparks everywhere, and there's all fire inside the box, and it was all burnt out and charred. I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> so it wasn't wow. actually on, wow. on fire I'm then. Great, because <laughs> it was running. It's one of those things that it was making a horrendous noise, but obviously it's tucked in, right? So I'm reasonably yeah. okay with the sound of electrical arcing. I know what it sounds like, but if you if you weren't familiar with that sound, and you're just like, "Well, it's still running." <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. it was. Sure, sure. Was your fridge loaded wow. with food? Pardon? Was your fridge loaded with food? Yeah, that's generally what what fridges are used for. Did you use well, yours for air be, conditioning or something? It could be right before he's, he's the saying, shop. He's My saying, point well, is, yeah. you would have to get a cooler, right? Put everything in. No, the freezer stuff we just took to my wife's friend's house, so she's got a big chest freezer and she took it all in there. And then over the course of the last 24 hours, we just slowly transferred stuff from fridge to freezer. And now it's, you know, getting to the end of its coolness. So by the end of today, there'll be nothing cold at all. Because that Thanks happened to me, but I wasn't so lucky. It happened when I was away. When we came back, everything was just like melted in bed. Not a fire, the fridge just went on its Yeah, that could, uh, especially in the big freezer, people have thousands of dollars worth of food. <laughs> so are you going to get a new fridge today? I don't think so. It's too expensive, so hopefully we'll get the one fixed that we have. How much is a fridge? Um, well, the fridge that we have was about £750. I think we got it fa fairly cheap. It's like a big American thing. Yeah, Massive. Yeah. We had to take it to pieces just to get it in through the door. You don't have uh, someone with the smaller ones just to get by until you fix it? Well, no. It is it is irritating on account of the fact that a fridge is one of those things that sits right in that horrible price bracket where it's not so expensive that you could consider it something that would last forever, but not so cheap that it's worth throwing away. It's in that horrible in-between ground, a bit like an iPhone or something similar. It's considered by a retailer disposable. I'm like, uh, uh, no, I'm not going to throw away a thousand pound fridge just because this one circuit board gone wrong. That seems ludicrous. 
How old is the fridge? Um, uh, pretty old. I don't know. <laughs> it's just well, not I, I'm worth just, throwing I'm away. I'm not cause... like that. I hate throwing things away that cost a lot of money. It's just, it's just no, not no, my I, ethos. I, I, I I'm just like saying it. because my parents and uh, even uh, myself, not as long as them, but man, they had a fridge that was nearing 30 years. Yeah, fridges are supposed to last forever. Yeah, 30 years. One one guy told me his went 35 years. Right, this is probably less than five years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they go forever. Must be American made. Uh, just everything consumable. It just The quality is lower and lower and lower. Anyway, this is yes. recording this nonsense, boring conversation about my broken fridge. It will not turn well, into I a GoFundMe. I, I thought it was a cool conversation myself, but... Nathan, have me. you seen uh, Mitchell from Australia's latest Coriolis video? Yes, it's excellent. I, lo- I really like it's that It's really video. good. And I kudos to Mitchell, because I've got to be honest, I, I, I'm i pretty lazy unless I've actually got the bit between my teeth. So with Thunderfoot, um, I've just spent all morning doing a response, right? All morning editing a response together. Um, whereas... Simon Dan, he just he strikes me as so stupid. It's not worth responding to him. You know, he obviously yeah. doesn't understand Coriolis effect at all. Um, but when someone like Mitchell does it, he's that little bit more cheeky chappy than me. So he's I don't know. I appreciate him doing it more than probably other people would appreciate me in a very dry way pulling apart his total lack of understanding when it comes to Coriolis. But hats off to you, Mitchell. Great job. And and he. Uh, used a new point which is another one of those where you kind of slap your own face and go of course why didn't i ever phrase it like that with the stars genius yeah the stars have got to stop rotating when you're uh, in the in the sky not according to the iss yeah that debunks the whole reference frame circumstance that they assert to give them coriolis effect from the ground as per the neil degrasse tyson example it was an excellent breakdown by uh, Mitchell and a, a I agree kudos to him. completely we need to focus up as well on the contradiction between Simon Dan or no Simon Dan and um, Neil deGrasse because Neil deGrasse says that the, the, the field goal kick proves that the earth rotates and that caused it and then Simon Dan says it doesn't rotate so we need to dwell on that as well but he needs to get kudos because his video is really good yeah, I couldn't agree more. He did he's just a very good job. I mean, they always are. Mitchell always does a good job. Um, but in that particular instance, I just thought, really well done. I'm going to play it. Does anybody object? No, no, not no, at all. Man, no, I was going to ask you. What I was going to suggest it. It was great. And the other thing as well is oh, um, I contacted Fight the Flat Earth on purpose just to see whether or not which side he fell on. I wanted to know, did he agree with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson that the earth does turn underneath the ball as he kicks it? Or does he agree with, um, what's his face, Simon Dan, when he says that the earth does not rotate underneath the, uh, the the thing that's in the non-rotating frame of reference? And basically, I realized it was a massive mistake because all he did was he started laughing about how stupid I was and all that. And I'm like, I shouldn't have asked you. I should have asked somebody like Rumpus that will actually have a go at addressing the question. But, um, yeah, so Fight the Flat Earth, I had to just block him in the end because I realised that he's a waste of time. Right, I'm going to play this video out. Star rotations and sunsets debunk the globe. Yes, Mitchell from Australia is a YouTuber flat earther that thinks that us Globers are going to regret ever saying that star rotation and sunsets prove the Earth spin. Let's take a close look at his reasoning, shall we? I'm Mitchell from Australia, and being from Australia, I get called the dumbest of the dumb flat earthers. This is because the Globers say that southern star rotation debunks the flat earth. But this argument is going to be your downfall, Globe Believers, because on your model, stars aren't actually rotating, are they? It's the Earth rotating underneath the stars. And you're asserting that you're on that rotating Earth, looking up at the stars, making the stars appear to be rotating, not actually rotating. Yep, that's the general gist of it. Just like this demonstration of a drone leaving the rotating reference frame of a roundabout. From the rotating reference frame, 
it appears that the drone is deviating. But as we can see, the drone just goes up and hovers. It doesn't go anywhere. This is an apparent deviation. Okay, we get your point. The scale is slightly off, but hey, well done. And this is what Globus will tell you is happening when you see stars rotating in the sky. But what this also demonstrates is what we observe from the inertial reference frame while looking at another thing in the inertial reference frame. This drone is in the inertial reference frame and the camera looking at the drone and the roundabout is also in the inertial reference frame. So as you can see, when viewing something else in the inertial reference frame from the inertial reference frame, the drone is no longer appearing to move. Yes, 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 but how does all this prove that we don't rotate? So let's take another look at the stars, and this time we're going to leave the asserted rotating reference frame of the Earth and enter the inertial reference frame above the Earth. These stars are already in the inertial reference frame. So when we view from the drone entering the inertial reference frame, the stars should not move. Just like when we see the drone in the inertial reference frame, it does not move. But we still see the stars moving. Um, ah, how do I? Only joking, Mitchell. Your drone remains in the rotating reference frame. It does not move into the inertial reference frame, as you say. No! If your drone is hovering over a particular spot on Earth, then it remains in rotation with the Earth, doesn't it? Close no! to the, the... I did a quick calculation, and I tweeted. The winning field goal in that game was aided by a one-third of an inch deflection to the right from Earth's rotation. Ah, this must be embarrassing for you, Simon and Dan, not knowing how your own globe model works, rebelling against your high priest, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who famously detailed how when a ball is kicked, it leaves the rotating reference frame of the Earth and enters the inertial reference frame making the ball seem to apparently deviate due to the Earth rotating underneath. This is Coriolis, Simon and Dan. So if we can see Coriolis in something like a football with a short hang time, we're damn well going to see Coriolis in something like a drone with a very long hang time. If the Earth were actually spinning. But you detail it correctly, Simon and Dan, by saying we do not see an apparent deviation in the drone hovering. Therefore, we do not have Earth-based Coriolis, and we do not have a spinning Earth. That's our argument, Simon and Dan. Welcome to Flat Earth. But your little drone isn't leaving the spinning Earth, is it? Have you realised the implication of this, Globus? The stars are the things that are actually moving, not the Earth underneath it. The thing is, Mitchell, you're always going to see star trails. Check out this picture from the ISS. Absolutely awesome. And look, star trails. <laughs> Quality example, Simon and Dan. But instead of going after the impossibility of star trails being seen by the ISS, unless it's doing barrel rolls, I'm going to attack where the ISS is. In space, you say, the sky vacuum. Yeah, that violates natural law. The gas we breathe would absolutely fill the available space of the sky vacuum, as dictated in the second law of thermodynamics. This is entropy. You think the ISS can reside in a place that violates natural law? Nah, space is fake, mate. And the Earth is stationary, as you detailed before. Your video is going downhill quick, Simon and Dan. If it were actually Earth rotation, making the stars appear to rotate, then when we leave the spinning Earth, we wouldn't see this. The stars should stay still, but yet they keep spinning. But this also applies to all celestial bodies, because you ballers assert that the sun sets and rises. 
also due to Earth rotation. So let's view the Sun from the inertial reference frame. Same argument, same misunderstanding. The drone has left the rotating reference frame of the Earth, but yet the Sun still appears to set. We go up again, and the Sun sets again. This is not caused by Earth rotation, because the Earth is not actually rotating. Mitchell from Australia there literally proving the curve by filming the sunset, moving up higher and watching it set again. Well done Mitchell, well done. The curve you say Simon Dan. Well let me introduce you to our good friend the black swan, which absolutely demolishes the possibility of any curvature and debunks the radius of your globe. Because in order to have a curve and block things like the sun and the bottom of ships, you would need to have a geometric horizon which on a sphere of radius 3959 miles can be no further than 1.22 times the square root of the observer height in feet. So at an observer height of 8 feet, the geometric horizon can be no more than 3.46 miles, Simon and Dan. But as you can see in the black swan image, all those arrows are pointing to the horizon, which are way past 10 miles. Yeah, your globe is good and dead. No curvature, no space, and no rotation. So have you actually got any evidence of this curvature you speak of, Simon and Dan? Oh, wait a minute. Of course I have. <laughs> Does that mean my table is evidence of curvature too, Simon and Dan? Nope, wrong again. You still fail to see how our world really works. Things disappear bottom up as they move away from us, not due to curvature, but due to angular resolution. The angle from the observer to the coin has become so small that it is no longer resolvable. But if we increase the angle from the observer by zooming in, this resolves the coin again. It is not blocked by any curvature. It is not blocked by anything at all, just like your example of the boat disappearing bottom up as it moves away from us. That angle from the observer to the bottom of the boat gradually gets so small that it is unresolvable from the bottom up. So to recap what we've learned from Simon and Dan, the earth does not spin, space is fake, and there is no curvature. There we go, another Flat Earth Friday done and dusted, and what a great one it was. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please, please do like and subscribe. I'm also going to give the audience a, a bit of a twofer. Line up nicely. There we go. So I've edited a short version of my longer version of my response to Thunderfoot. So I might as well play out just the first bit, and then I'll start the live show. Oh, so close. You just missed off that little bit on the end there. You know, an explanation for gases dumbed down to the point that even flat earthers might be able to understand it. Might. Feel all available microstates, entropy. Oh, you've got to dumb it right down for somebody as moronic as Thunderfoot. Don't mention microstates. Thunderfoot's never going to understand such terminology. Microstates, no, you're getting way too complicated for a clown. See, I can add hom to Thunderfoot, you moron. You understand what a microstate is, moron? Yet Nobel Prize waiting for you if you violate the second law of thermodynamics, Thunderfoot. You won't. Uh, a vacuum. And if I open the tap between these two, you will see spontaneously the bromine rush from one to the other. All that happens is a change in entropy. The expansion into a vacuum, nothing else is involved. There's no energy change, there's no temperature change, there's no change except entropy. The gas expands into a vacuum. And the skies claim to be a vacuum, an available space for that entropy increase to take place. And what he's just described is natural law, inviolable, applicable always. 
I am correct here. That will never change. Therefore, he will not have a response. We need to see gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container in violation of natural law to justify your fundamentalist religious assertion that the sky is a vacuum in violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Your current rebuttal as it stands is gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls because it's got a downward vector with gravity. That is not how gas behaves. Gas does not require sweeping up. It does not go down, go boom, boom with a single vector of gravity. That is not what gas does. Thunderfoot is wrong. He simply doesn't understand gas behavior. He's been demonstrated a moron by us, which is why he's responded. Now, moron, clown show, Thunderfoot, take this as my response. Obviously, we wouldn't get into the detail of microstates with someone like Thunderfoot. We need to dumb this right down for a clown that thinks that gas behaves like bouncy balls. It doesn't. None of the gas in that demonstration fell to the bottom of the chamber. The bromine rush from one to the other. Obviously, it didn't behave like Thunderfoot's bouncy balls. He's a moron. And how proud it is to tell this moron globe-believing retard how moronic he is as a flat earther who does understand entropy, who does understand how fake space is and how he's been deceived and how that deception has left him making declarations of absolute stupidity to audiences of almost a million people. Almost a million people being poisoned with his abject stupidity about how gas behaves. No practical demonstration with a gas him pouring a solid into a fish tank. I really enjoy telling Thunderfoot how stupid he is, with, uh, with total justification and a smile on my face. Not, you didn't understand me pouring bouncy balls into a fish tank. It was dumbed down too much for you flat earthers. No, we have natural law, which we can describe with the number of available microstates that would be on offer by a sky vacuum. Because we understand entropy here, Thunderfoot. Unlike you, you moron. He thinks that solids behave like gases, making you thick. Are we all proud to be telling this million subscriber moron globehead how thick he is? I'm proud. Proud to be a flat earther. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. Has this live stream not actually started? God damn it. <laughs> right, it's going to be a take two. The live stream didn't start. Just like that Brian one. God damn it, Brian. God damn. Right, let's try that again. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. 
If you'd like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live. And there's also PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show. And one last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by Arwin, 10th Man, Sleeping Warrior, Paul Hall and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey, Nathan. We have a request from Rumpus. He can't get in Discord. He's dying to get in and tell you how stupid you are for gas good angle boom boom, but it's full. Any chance you could get somebody or get someone to drop so that he can join? Absolutely not. Any evidence no. of Earth curvature, formerly known as the geometric horizon? Not from the British Grand Prix. Maybe Rumpus has some. <laughs> Rumpus is surplus to requirements. I know, but I like him coming in and getting kicked for being an idiot. <laughs> right, you just want to see him humiliated. I just no, want to I've see... Got... I've got bets on this with different people for how long he can last before he gets kicked. I've got him down as less than two minutes. I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> He's got nothing to offer. We don't need him for anything at the moment, unless you know different. I just want to hear his explanation for Gasco down, go boom, boom. He thinks that Thunderfoot's correct. And I'm like, that's contrary to his normal position that Thunderfoot is... Well, his normal position is that gas would fill the fill the, the container, but he's now saying that gas go down, go boom, boom. That's a shift in his paradigm shift. So I'd like incorrect. to hear what, why. No worries. You just need to show us gas pressure without a container. So we've had uh, earth curvature. Let's have that question straight off the bat. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure, that's gas pressing, without something for it to press upon? That's a container. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without a container? Has Rumpus got a demonstration in this violation of natural law? Has he got that? Well, there's no well, way to demonstrate this. Just look down from a plane, Nathan. You can see all the atmospheric gases are all pooling on the Earth at the bottom, right? All oh, right. That's that will be your demonstration of gas pressure without a container. No. How would we acquire said gas pressure in the first instance without a container? That assertion that that gas pressure is uncontained stands in violation of the natural law called the second law of thermodynamics inviolable if this black area on screen right now was a 10 to the minus 17 tor vacuum then all of this gas would fill this space it's called yeah. entropy but for some reason nathan it pools on the surface Why no it does it do not that? you will not show me a demonstration of gas pooling on the top of a pond requiring skimming off the top surface. That does not happen. But what about the mist? The mist in the morning, you know, sometimes a layer of mist. I do see Rumpus in. Let's see, let's see if, he can, uh, if he can contribute successfully like a, an adult. Are you there, Rumpus? <sighs> Oh gosh! I am my here. answer, I am my here. answer answered this. Uh, the British Grand Prix. The tires were blown out. The gas then go down. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, the gravitational force of the uh, brake discs or the or the, uh, uh, the or the hub on the wheel is not sufficient to attract the gas. So you wouldn't expect it to. You only get gravitational attraction when you have a really, really, really big thing like the Earth that's pulling on the ga on the gas molecules. What's gravity? Gravitational attraction. You can't, not, gravitational attraction doesn't attract anything. It's an effect. It's just all forces are effects. Why does everyone in G plus sound like they're in a bathroom? Is they it just are, me? all of them. I thought you were in a bathroom, no, Anthony. Are you in the bathroom? It sounds like he's in the jail cell. It's what, sorry? He does sound... Three... I've got three people talking to me. Nobody's talking to you. I'm talking to Sleeping Warrior. Why do you sound like you're all in a bathroom? Right. What's that? What's going on? Oh, is it, have I changed my microphone somehow? Sounds terrible. Uh, you, you do sound terrible, that with uh, Anthony. Hmm. So you've asserted that, that we've got gravitational attraction. 
So gra gravity is yep. a bending of a conceptual medium known as pseudo Ramonian force space. It's, it's also a force. No, it's not. Gravity. Yes, it is. Sorry, I'll just try and respond. Let's see how quickly I get interrupted. I'll quote Brian Cox. Quote, gravity is not really a force at all. End quote. Also, George Musa. Gravity is not a force. But you can think of it as a force. It's not a force. It's not holding gas. And if you assert that it is... I'm going to need to see you show me conceptual mediums holding gas pressure without a container. Can you demonstrate it? Don't need a description. Right. Need to show me. 30 seconds after George Musa made that comment, he then said, it has to be treated as a force, and I do treat it as a force. And Brian Cox didn't say it, and he used the phrase there, not really. And the reason is, of course, because you don't understand that gravity is an umbrella term no, for two things. Me. One, don't add me. One I asked for a demo. Don't add hot me. Time. Don't tell me what I don't one understand. Space don't add time. Time. I'm telling you, you're interrupting me. One yeah, is I'm the telling space you, don't add hot me. Einstein thing. This oh isn't going to get God. tolerated very long. One is the space time, and the second one is the Newtonian. Gravity is an umbrella term for two different things. One is the force of gravity, and the other one is the bending of space time. Okay, did you hear what I said? I asked no. you to you show me? me this conceptual medium bending and containing gas with its not actual force. I want a demonstration, not a description from you. Show me. So, sorry, are you asking me for the, the Einsteinian bending of space-time, or are you talking about the force of gravity? I'll try once it, more. It? I'll try, alas, this final time I'll try. Without okay. a fundamentalist religious assertion, that would be you raising your arm to the sky. Add on. Add on. Sorry, Add I'm, on. I haven't finished talking. Add on. I haven't finished Add talking. On. Have I got to mute Add you? On. Have I got to mute you? I haven't Kick finished talking. So, without you raising your arm, pointing to the sky, and asserting your fundamentalist religious assertion about what you believe the sky Add to on. be, that's the second attempt. Mute him. I'll try again, see if he fucks off or sticks his fingers in his ears while he mutes me by talking through me. I'll try a third time. Without pointing to the sky and utilising a fundamentalist religious assertion that the sky is a vacuum, I would like a demonstration of this not actual force, a bending concept, maintaining gas pressure without a container. I'd like you to show me. Well, it is an actual force. We can You can get on some bathroom scales and... I don't want you to describe it. I'll say it again. I want you to show me, not describe it to all the me. gas molecules in show the me. atmosphere, and he's pulling it to the ground. Just Don't like describe it. it. Show me. Don't tell me what the atmosphere is doing. That's pointing to the sky with your fundamentalist religious belief about atmosphere, scales. isn't it? Get Don't scales. describe show it. Show it me. Scales weigh solids. They weigh gas as well. Sorry, do they weigh them in a container? Doesn't matter, it's still... Sorry, it doesn't matter. Is that a yes? They do weigh them in a container. We're not going very far when I get to a point that destroys your argument and you say it doesn't matter like the other funder you came on on Friday. When I point out that you can't have Al Baruni measuring something you can't see, he says it doesn't matter. And now we're at the point that you're saying I need to look at a scale and I'm asking, given that the question is regards to not having a container, if a scale would need a container and you say it doesn't matter... You mean yes? No, it doesn't matter. That, sorry. No, it doesn't matter. So when I ask for gas pressure without a container and you say scale, does it require a container? Doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. It Because it requires a container. But initially, we we talk, we started talking off about how we demonstrate there's a force of gravity. And I no, we asked for gas pressure without a container. You asserted that a not actual force, a bending concept, could hold gas pressure here. I asked you to demonstrate it. You said scale. And I said that would require a container. You said that wasn't important, so I have teabagged you. That's what's actually happened. Let's take this in steps. Let's take this in steps. Okay, in steps. You got teabagged when you asserted that a scale was a demonstration of gas pressure without a container, and I asked, would that require a container? You said it didn't matter. It does matter. It matters because it requires a container, and the question is, how can you have gas pressure without a container? So it very much matters. It's my balls in your mouth showing how stupid you are because you're not demonstrating gas pressure without a container in violation of natural law rumpus. Any chance of me being able to respond? You can suck on my balls while I explain that a scale would require a container. You can suckle on those balls while I teabag you with them. That's what you can do. On here. Any slight chance of me being able to respond? Right. You can suck on my bollocks. 
your scale requires a container. Not doesn't matter, not moving on, not can I have a chance to speak. I heard your claim, then I stuck my bollocks in your mouth while you died on the ground, having been shot in the face by an assertion that you don't need a container, it doesn't matter, because you do require a container, and the question is how can you have gas pressure without a container, given that the heliocentric model has gas pressure without a container? You can't debate, can you? You're... Uh, sorry, I've just teabagged you. Can't debate. That's where you get lost. Telling me that I've lost and that I can't debate. When I take your claim that you can show gas pressure without a container with a scale, and then I ask you if that needs a container, and you tell me it doesn't matter. No, you can gag on my nuts. Not tell me that I've lost, you pathetic twat. Now get na fuck. Out you go, prick. He did really well, Anthony. Said you need a scale. Do you know, I, all, I almost feel like I need to apologise <laughs> for my learned friend's appearance. Yeah, he yeah, did very right. badly. You know exactly who was going to do that, Tony. He did very badly. No. <laughs> Shout out to Retro Bill. It says, good day, lads. NASA's uh, Michelle Thaler said, it's not okay to talk about flat Earth. So... I'll keep this short comment short. <laughs> right oh. Yeah, she's going to accuse you of wrong think that's right retro. Uh, actually, actually, he's misquoted her. What she actually said was it's not okay to think that the earth might be flat. Cuz I remember her saying it. It's like I remember she saying it in that like absolute shockingly like disgusting tone. It's not okay to think that the earth is flat. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> I might release... Well, just be, ca be careful. She's in the Space Hall of Fame now. As it's dealing with this particular housekeeping question, I'll release my edited version of the live show from, I believe it was Friday. Anyway, it ended up taking about 40 minutes, maybe an hour, talking about Thunderfoot in various different parts of the show with various gaps and other subjects covered in between. So what I've done is I've edited out all of the non-Thunderfoot-related stuff from that show and condensed it down to a shortened, maybe two-minute version that just addresses the main points, addresses his most recent video done three or four days ago. Um, so if you end up just watching the first two minutes as some people do, then you'll get the broad strokes and then you can see a condensed version of the full discussion which is still, it still ended up being 28 minutes long. I thought I'd try and get it down to like 15 minutes. It ended up being 28 minutes long. Anyway, I'll release that probably sometime after this live show goes out. Um, but that specifically addresses this housekeeping question that was just debated with Rumpus. And he got teabagged when he said scale and required containment to assert his downward vector of gravity. Yeah, that's where he lost. Of course, he asserted that I didn't know how to debate, having taken to pieces his claim and demonstrated it to be false. No, you cannot have gas pressure without a container in violation of natural law. Your only assertion would be to beg the question of a single downward vector, and if you assert it with grass, uh, grass with gas, you're going to require containment also. As was pointed out to Rumpus, his response being that doesn't matter. What? The end of your argument doesn't matter? Yeah, you can claim that, but you'll just be kicked out when you lose and have no humility and fail to actually acknowledge that I've defeated your argument. It's pathetic, loser. Go and moan on Jose's about how badly I did, right? That's what you typically do. Any scientific evidence of gravity? They can't, honestly, they can't even define what it is, let alone demonstrate it. Rumpus still tells people that gravity is a force. It's like, what? I thought we had that concession a few ages ago, but now he's back to it. I think it's because he realises that his whole paradigm fails when he can't have Newton's apple accelerating without a force because he hasn't got one anymore. He used to have one, but he doesn't have it anymore and he hasn't got any alternative. So he has to re revert back to the previous position, which is that gravity is a force and we all know it isn't. I think what's also I'm... interesting. Go on, go on. Just on a, on a side note to that, I, I remind myself that only school children that go on to do college then go on to university to study physics at undergrad level. 
Only those select few get told the equivalence that gravity is not a force. Everybody else gets told that it is a force. All your children are being lied to, guys. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, we're being we we're poisoned with the nonsense, and the nonsense will lumber you as a globehead, making declarations of abject stupidity that get demolished and completely railroaded by flat earthers, leaving you with the only defence that we don't understand or you can't debate when you win. That's the best you've got when we pummel you. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? No, no, no. No. Don't be shy in Discord. <laughs> Negative. I'm still evidence? recovering from rumpus. Have there been actual scientists uh, that are like into physics that also have like astronomy uh, hobbies on the side? But then maybe <laughs> in an indirect way, some of them may have actually performed science, just not within their field. Right, this is too irritating. I'm going to refresh. Um, I'm going to disconnect and refresh from the Hangouts because it's so irritating. It sounds like you're all in a bathroom. Yeah, it must be you. Oh, do I do I sound right to you guys? Yeah, sounded normal. Oh, there we go. No, yeah, you sound, sound bad before. to me. No, you sounded no. good before too. There we go. Is that any better? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, same. I think, I, I think what happened was it kicked better me from now. the first. It kicked me from the first hangout, but kept me connected. So I was actually technically in two hangouts at the same time. I think that was the problem. Ah. Much better. Right, should we continue with housekeeping? Yeah, I'll go on then. Any, did we do distance to the sun? No. Oh. Again, distance to the sun is like one of those ones where you need a definition of the sun because it's like, how do you know that the sun's a physical object that is capable of triangulation in the first instance? Because it appears to be metaphysical. It might not actually be physical. You know, it might not I'm be Sorry to interrupt. I've, I've, got a, I've got a phone call coming through and it might be about my fridge that blew up. Tenth, can you carry on with housekeeping? Which blew up? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do it. No problem. All right, back to uh... Nathan seems to have uh, some technical problems today. No, no, you fridge missed it. Iron. His fridge uh, caught on fire on the weekend. That was uh, on the on the pre-show. But let's move on with the uh, sun. Go on, Anthony. Fire? What? It's a, see, me and Arwen don't always agree on everything, but on this topic, I, this one topic, I'm like, someone needs to prove that the sun is physical before we start considering the possibility that we can triangulate for it. Because the ballers say, yeah, well, if you triangulate it from more than two positions, three positions, that's impossible on a flat plane. That's also evidence that it's not, it's metaphysical. Because right, if so, it doesn't try... No, no, you're right. So, so the question is, any evidence to the distance? And you're saying there's no way to gain this distance unless... No, there is well, no distance to gain. There is no distance. There yeah, is we need no to... object to have a distance in the first place. It's just an apparition. Because I remember when Sly did his uh, observation Hang for the on, sun. Sleeping Warrior, you sounded a lot like Arwen there. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I like it. Pretty good. I like it. Yeah, I, I thought You've it was good. You've done well, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I answer Nathan. for him? Sorry. No, you did well. Yeah. <laughs> Back to you, Nathan, unless you want me to keep going. No, I'm all good. It wasn't even the bloody fridge man <laughs> not that this is relevant for a live show i'm really sorry those watching live i typically wouldn't do that but uh yeah well, my fridge I thought exploded Sleeping warriors ventral coast uh was pretty good <laughs> yeah it was it was very arwin-esque i liked it a lot any, any more for any more on the distance of the sun or can we move on to uh earth radius the r value uh, i quite like the distance of the sun argument go on then move on to the earth radius one i'm gonna go and get a quick coffee Oh, right. You're disappearing when it comes to the Black Swan. No, no, because yeah. I know that other people want to have a talk, so I'll just go and make a brew. Fair enough. Any evidence of the R value, Earth radius? No. No, the Black uh, Swan took a big dump in that word soup. Time to mention uh, Mitchell from Australia again. Yeah, we played out um, Mitchell from Australia's video in the pre-show. He did an exceptionally good job of debunking Simon Dan, who doesn't understand Coriolis effect. So... 
Simon Dan has demonstrated on multiple occasions that he hasn't got a clue how the reference frames work with an Earth that's claimed to rotate underneath an inertial reference frame at 15 degrees an hour, causing things like bullets and balls to deviate. And Mitchell from Australia took Neil deGrasse Tyson's example of a ball being kicked and seeming to drift from the stands because Earth's rotating underneath it. And then Simon Dan's words were, oh, no, it's not leaving the inertial ref- It's not leaving the non-inertial reference frame of an Earth that spins. It's like, well, then you don't have Coriolis effect. Not only that, if you're claiming that we're spinning underneath the stars causing them to rotate, why would it be the case that you'd ever get a star rotation view from the ISS? All of these things are debunking the notion that we've got a spinning Earth. Welcome to Flat Earth. So big kudos and big props to Mitchell from Australia. Um, I think I've still got his uh, video in my... Let's just see. Yes, I have. So check it out. That's the video we're talking about. Um, if, you've, if you're watching this on a premiering stream, you've obviously already watched it at the beginning of this show. Um, but check him out. If you haven't subscribed to Mitchell from Australia already, go and subscribe to him. He makes exceptionally good videos. This is not a one-off by Mitchell. It's, it's typical... Mitchell from Australia video, um, but very amusing in the respect that I too have also had my tete-a-tete with Simon Dan in regards to his total lack of understanding with Coriolis, and it was I've just not gone to the effort of really doing a good edited video and taking his words and putting them in con- contrast with someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is precisely what Mitchell did. So big props to you, my friend. Hey, did you notice, Nathan, that uh, he covered the top three in, in his special way? I did at the end, yeah. He's, he's, he's just he's obviously a fan of the show. I'm not saying he's done it because of us. He's, he's his own man and all the rest of it. But by the same token, you can hear some, some flat earth debate aspects coming through in terms of his language. And it just makes me smile. I'm like, good. I hope there's more people that go out there and just put these arguments in the concise way that Mitchell does. Because you'll pummel people. Yep, yep, yep. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of said presupposed spherical Earth? No, no, just a few, just a few interpretations from seismographs and squiggles on paper. That's about it. P waves, that and was, S waves, timings. That was, that was the fastest coffee anyone ever. Yeah, had. that was quick. Yeah, yeah, the kettle was already boiled, so I just had to put milk in and you know the usual. But P waves and S waves are the best they've got. An interpretation of squiggles on a paper or a, an algorithm on a computer. No actual evidence of anything below eight miles. That's it. What else haven't we covered? Just... I'm sure I've missed one. Vacuum? No, I've covered the vacuum. Uh, any evidence of axial rotation? Oh, right. I suppose we just covered that with Mitchell, really, didn't we? That was in respect to axial rotation of the Earth based variety. I think we've covered them all indirectly. That's it. That concludes the housekeeping questions. So what do we do now then? Well, I'm going to plug my <laughs> show that I've got. I'm just about to premiere it or set the premiere time for when this live show finishes. So uh, be here or be sphere at 3 p.m. UK time for... Oh, I've just got the working title. Damn it. It's just going to end up working with the working title. So I've put it Thunderfoot demonstrated stupid at a at the intermolecular level. Let's repeat that. Thunderfoot demonstrated stupid at the intermolecular level. That's the name of the video. And uh, let's just click save and then I'll get the link and spam it in the chat. So that's going to premiere at 3 p.m. Soon as this live show finishes. So be here or be sphere and go and check it out once the live stream finishes. I've scheduled it now. And uh, as I say, I'll put a link in the live stream chat so you can go and check it out once the live stream finishes. And I'll spam it again towards the end, hopefully, if I remember. Um, but uh, I've taken a lot of time over it. It's probably more editing than I've ever done on any video ever. But there we go. It was worth it. Thunderfoot's like got a million you, uh... subs. They need to know he's a complete moron. It's worth the effort, in my view. He's my bitch. It's worth the effort. i like to highlight uh, what happened with Rumpus for everyone. Um, you asked for a demonstration. And all he did was give descriptions, but no demonstration no physical proof, nothing that you can test. Yeah, it's the same with the Coriolis argument. When you ask them for positive evidence for like, for the apparent deflection that we, we all must observe from our rotating reference point, they, they don't give any. They give explanations to do with, well, it's because the latitude, the latitude and, and the rate of uh, rotation is X and Y and different, and we don't want to see that. We want to see the actual evidence, the positive evidence of apparent deflection from our Earth-based rotation because they've got to deviate. And if it's north to south flights, there's got to be a curved trajectory. If it's east to west flights, it's got to be faster in perception of time from our perspective. 
We don't see that though. So rather than addressing the evidence that's missing, they start excusing why the evidence is not there rather than demonstrating why it is there and the correction that's made for it. They're arguing our arguments for us, not realizing it's our arguments. Yep. It's consistent throughout the entire globe earth flat earth debate. Where's your edge? Boats go over the edge, you say? Where is it? What's the response? You flat earthers have got boats going over the edge. What the hell? What's going on? The weakest part of your argument is the claim that we have earth curve, actually an effect of perspective and atmospheric conditions, which you assert with a debunking from your own side that we don't have geometric horizons. That's earth curve. So what's the response we get challenged to give them an earth curve, an edge of a disc model provided by the Flat Earth Society? What about Coriolis? Earth turns underneath at 15 degrees an hour according to the ball earth claim that earth spins. Well, nothing's deviating at 15 degrees an hour. Flight times aren't shortened because Earth's turning underneath them. Drones aren't drifting away at 15 degrees an hour. But yet Neil deGrasse Tyson says that's exactly what happens. The ball gets kicked and the goalposts move underneath the ball. That's the claim. But it doesn't get demonstrated in anything other than these short hang time assertions from priests being interviewed by sycophants who won't challenge them in any way, shape or form or point out that if Earth turns under a football, then it turns under an aeroplane and a drone and a hot air balloon. And obviously we don't experience those things. It's nonsense. Earth is not rotating. And as Mitchell from Australia points out, if Earth rotating under the inertial reference frame with the stars in it is what causes them to go in a circle, why the hell would we ever see it from the ISS? They're debunking their own claim that's supposed to be proving it spins by showing we haven't got these two separate reference frames. Yeah. I want to know which one is correct because Simon Dan is quoted by Mitchell and he's, he's doing it on screen. He's saying that um, the plane is rotating with the Earth. But Neil deGrasse Tyson states that when the field goal is kicked, the Earth turns underneath the ball. So which one is it? Is it Simon Dan that's correct, or is it Neil deGrasse Tyson? Because one of them, they're both opposing arguments. Both cannot be true. Now, I, no! to the, the... I did a quick calculation, and I tweeted, the winning field goal in that game was aided by a one-third of an inch deflection to the right from Earth's rotation. Ah, this must be embarrassing for you, Simon and Dan, not knowing how your own globe model works. Yep. It seems that no matter what they do, so long as they address it in any way with ridicule, it doesn't matter what they say, so long as they apply ridicule, they just keep confusing the audience to what their model should be doing and what it is actually doing. And so long as they keep ridiculing, doesn't matter what they say, as long as they can ridicule, that's it. Yeah, next example, it's gas pressure without a container. Neil deGrasse Tyson telling you all about how science is right, whether you prove it or not, only to simultaneously tell you these lights in the sky are physical rocks in a sky vacuum. What do we get as a rebuttal? What's the dome made out of? Uh, no, 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 hold on, we're breathing gas pressure. There must be containment. I have no idea what the sky is, nor do I make any assertions in that regard. But I understand the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy dictates that if the sky was a vacuum, the gas we're breathing would fill it. Now, gas doesn't have an exclusively downward vector. It does not go down, go boom, boom, like solid, bonded, bouncy balls. This downward vector requires you to infer your fundy belief in gravity when talking about how gas behaves. Now, Rumpus earlier on in the show, to make this assertion, says it behaves with weight. You can put it on a scale. What, without a container? Oh, no, without the container, the gas would fill the space. That's entropy. That's how gas behaves. But they will challenge us to prove that this is a sky dome. I'm not making any claim about that. But there is one asserted by the controlled opposition. They'll assert we've got a dome. Well, I don't make that claim. I just know that we need containment to have gas pressure here. Without the container, there can be no pressure. Not, where's your dome? Oh, well, if there isn't a sky vacuum, why would we need a dome? I don't make any claims about what the sky is. Why would I? Yeah? I'm not telling you what heaven is. Neil deGrasse Tyson's telling you all about what heaven is, though. Star Wars version of heaven. Sky vacuum. A violation of natural law. I like it the way Mitchell cut his video and edited where Neil starts off with no. And then he says, I did a quick calculation and I tweeted. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't catch that, that bit actually. I, I might. I'm tempted to just play that bit again, just because it's prior to Neil deGrasse Tyson saying no. We actually get to heal uh, uh, Simon Dan's incorrect assertion. How do I? Only joking, Mitchell. Your drone remains in the rotating reference frame. So then, there's no Coriolis effect. If it remains in the rotating reference frame then you don't have 15 degrees an hour deviation of the Earth rotating underneath the drone. That's Coriolis effect, Simon Dan. The claim that we have 15 degrees an hour deviation as Earth rotates underneath. So if it stays in the rotating reference frame, you're merely begging the question, assuming that Earth is rotating and the atmosphere is rotating with it. That doesn't give you a Coriolis claim to be proof of Earth spinning. It's just you begging the question. You moron. Yeah, we get. I made a, I made, I made an on. error because um, Simon Dan has said the opposite to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I actually thought it would be a good test of uh, somebody that's like a third party on their side just to play one off the other. And I actually thought that Fight the Flat Earth would be somebody useful here to correct one of the other. You know, like if, if Simon Dan's correct, then he could support him and point out that Neil deGrasse is incorrect. Or he could correct Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, or whichever way around. And I, I realised once he started talking in message that he just needs to go back on block because I actually thought foolishly that fa that fight the flat earth would have some element of scientific supporting argument one way or the other but what i actually got back from him was you're too stupid and don't understand so i just put him back on block so i made an error i actually thought somebody that's prolific in their side would be able to address this confusion that simon dan appears to have with neil degrasse tyson i'll do it with their words it's no problem uh 15 degrees an hour simon dan let's just have him make his claim and re-rebut it on the spot um ah how do i only joking mitchell your drone remains in the rotating reference frame uh it's supposed to drift at 15 degrees an hour you are a moron don't you know about the 15 degrees an hour you think it stays in the same reference frame what about the 15 degrees an hour claim that earth rotates underneath simon and are you unaware of the 15 degrees an hour you stupid retard there you go how's that anthony Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. I was hoping that Fight the Flat Earth would be able to address it, but he just resorted to ridicule and insult and stupidity and all that kind of nonsense. So if we can do that too. Simon Dan and Fight the Flat Earth are complete retards. Simon Dan here doesn't seem to realise that he's supposed to have 15 degrees an hour. Hasn't he heard this? Quoted by morons on his own side at nausea. 15 degrees an hour, Simon Dan. Haven't you heard about the 15 degrees an hour? Haven't you heard that Bob Nodal proved Earth's turning underneath the drone, you stupid dick? It's really easy to ridicule them for actual stupidity, Anthony. Hey, Nathan, I'd like to bring up uh, your excellent Black Swan versus Refraction video that you put out over the weekend. Uh, I've forgotten what that was, but tell me. Yeah, sure. Great. I love praise. Yeah, you put the comedy hour with QE and singing at the end of that one. You remember that one? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Okay. Now, the most important part of that video is the first part where you broke down uh, when the ballers have to use refraction, which is what we've been saying all along. And they have to, in a sense, throw under the bus their physical geometric horizon. So, let me make the bullet points and then give us a good summary again. So they say Al Biruni uh, measured the physical geometric horizon with the radius of 3959, which is how we get everything. Everything. But not possible if Al Biruni saw a refracted horizon. Now, Al Biruni never accounted for refraction. So obviously, he saw the horizon on that particular day at a particular time. But an hour later or a day later, it would change. 
So then they say, well, he was within 5% of it, meaning the physical geometric horizon. Well, what 5%? The hour later, 5%? A day later, 5%? That would have changed all the time. So the Earth radius has to be a stable 3959 for it to be geometric. And so he could never see the physical geometric horizon because it can't be seen because they say you need a no atmo day to be seen. So it's such a great argument, if you could summarize. Yeah, I mean, you've missed an important detail about the video itself. I mean, it, the, the first section, the first four minutes, it wouldn't have got me mid-roll ads, so I had to add that bit on the end. You know, times are tough. Need the mid-roll ads. Eight minutes minimum. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to that summary, because I think if every flat earther could understand when they say refraction, they're actually saying, welcome me to flat earth. <laughs> yeah. What we're being told in rebuttal to the black swan is... Quote, we do not see the geometric horizon, end quote. Quote, the geometric horizon only exists in maths, end quote. Quote, we wouldn't expect to see geometry, end quote. That geometry is Earth curve. The Earth curve that is claimed to get in the way of boats and buildings in the distance at the horizon. The horizon is claimed to be the Earth curve blocking your view with its physicality. We are simultaneously told that we do not see Earth Curve. We wouldn't expect to see Earth Curve. Earth Curve cannot be seen. And Earth Curve only exists in Earth Curve maths. Therefore, when told that you can get within 5% of it, within 5% of the maths that they assume, because you can't see it to measure it, to get within 5% of it, it can't be seen to measure it to confirm you within 5% of it. As for the claim that goes along with it, that you can then confirm it from space, that would require a violation of the natural law that is entropy. You're not going to be taking pictures of a sphere Earth from a fake place that would leave us with no gas to breathe. So Al Biruni can't see and cannot measure a geometric horizon to give you the maths, to give you R, to claim that that very R value when applied with 7 over 6 R terrestrial refraction will bend the horizon into a position that is within 5% of the maths that you can't measure. It's the death of the globe. Earth is flat. Well done. Yeah. And just just no, notice as well that um, rather than addressing where the positive evidence for the deflection actually is supposed to be, they they're making excuses for why it's not there, but they don't tell you that it should be there. They make excuses for why it's not there, and then everybody argues for why it isn't there. But that's our argument. They don't they don't tell people that that's our argument. They claim that it's theirs. No. You need to be showing us where the Coriolis effect is, not arguing for why it's not there. That's us. Stupid. Yeah, Dan, Simon Dan, back to Simon Dan, the clown that doesn't understand 15 degrees an hour. He's saying that they're travelling together. So no 15 degrees an hour of Earth turning underneath, proving Earth's turning underneath, so I can prove Earth's turning. They travel as one, and I just assume it all travels together with absolutely no effect whatsoever to determine that Earth's rotating underneath at 15 degrees an hour. At a base level, Simon Dan's just thick as shit. He doesn't understand Coriolis. I've told him multiple times, stop talking about Coriolis, Simon Dan. You're thick. You have no clue even about what your claim of a globe Earth requires. 15 degrees an hour deviation of Earth rotating underneath, Simon Dan. Not Earth travelling with a drone in the same reference frame, you moron clown. You're all dumb. Don't you understand what 15 degrees an hour of Earth rotating underneath is? That's Coriolis effect, you stupid Muppet. I used to explain it away by saying conservation of momentum. Do you remember the trampoline on the back of the tractor iron video that somebody showed? Um, but when you do that both ways, you end up demonstrating that the Coriolis effect would be there and we don't see it real world. So they can't use conservation of momentum anymore because if it was, if the, if, see, if the tractor's pulling it right now, right? If the tractor was them, if he was pushing it the opposite way, um, the plane, and he's traveling the same direction that he is in the picture now, then there is going to be an apparent deflection because you would see it, but we don't see it in the real world. So they don't argue conservation of momentum anymore. 
that I think we're back to ballistics, uh, the arguments over ballistics against uh, non-ballistic flight. I think that's how they've, they're doing it at the moment. Let's that's just, not, let's just break true. this down. This is what Simon Dan sent to me via Twitter. So, again, Simon Dan, this, like your Twitter claim, is there's no 15 degrees an hour deviation of the tractor underneath. This is showing us it not deviating at 15 degrees an hour and not actual, not actual deflection. So no, not actual deflection of the tractor underneath at 15 degrees an hour. That's what Coriolis requires to prove we're spinning. 15 degrees an hour of the earth rotating underneath. Yet Simon Dan tweets this to me. Uh, you're supposed to have deflection, Simon Dan. Like you're supposed to have deflection when you claim the drone remains in the same reference frame. Well, then it's not drifting at 15 degrees an hour, you clown. You don't understand Coriolis. Why are you still talking about Coriolis effect when you don't understand what it is? As long as he can argue it for his own audience and sound like he knows what he's talking about, the audience is left confused. That They think that Sam and Dan's explained it. They don't understand it as a result of it. But we all understand that there needs to be the apparent deflection from the Earth-based position. But like you said, if they're not showing the apparent deflection, then there is no Coriolis. And in that trampoline video, he's not showing apparent deflection from the Earth's rotation position. Right, 15 degrees an hour, Simon Dan. That's what you're supposed to be showing to prove Earth spins. You thicko. This is why these people don't come here. Because Simon Dan would get an absolute tongue lashing like he's getting now. Just not with him sat here. Because he's an abject coward. He'll preach to the converted. People who've already been indoctrinated from birth are about the level of appeal that he can appeal to. He can only talk to people who've been absolutely and totally indoctrinated with the rhetoric yep. that he's giving them. And in rebuttal, he's defying that very rhetoric by saying we don't have 15 degrees an hour deviation. The very thing that's supposed to prove Earth spins. He's defying. He's thick. He'd get told off by flat earthers if he ever came here. That's why he won't. Can't. Not won't. Can't. He can't come here, Dan. Because you'll get told off by flat earthers. And it would be humiliating with me asking you how we have 15 degrees an hour then when the drone stays in the same reference frame. And what would you do? Look and roll your eyes and say, hmm, I don't think I've got a response to that as I teabag your stupid ass. You're a thicko, Simon Dan. You haven't got a clue how Coriolis works and you would be told off by flat earthers were you to ever actually enter into debate with anybody ever, which you never will. You'll appeal to the brainwashed indoctrinated masses because you don't have to train them or educate them in anything. All you actually do is make yourself look stupid when you get it wrong. 15 degrees an hour, moron. Hey, Anthony. Yo. I've answered this uh ballistic one before uh if their argument is north to south if you shoot a say sniper rifle now if the earth is turning west to east in your mind say left to right for this illustration uh 15 degrees per hour then if you take a certain type of ballistics uh depending on the gunpowder your uh bullet is going to be traveling feet per second now, you would have to aim right of your target because it's moving west to east, okay, left to right. Anywhere from 750 feet to 1,500 feet in advance when you fire, hoping that as the earth turns in that second, that target appears where you aimed at a no target. That never happens, ever. It's a, the way I see that argument, it's a red herring argument anyway, because whether it's ballistic flight or not, if the Earth is supposed to be rotating under it, being ballistic or otherwise, then there still has to be apparent deflection. There is no, no apparent deflection, so it doesn't no, know, matter but, whether it's ballistic. No, I know, but you can kill their argument right there with their own stupidity. You have to aim away from your target where you think it's going to be in one second for a mile shot. And yeah. you're not aiming at anything. You're just hoping it gets there when the bullet gets there. No one does that. I know, yeah. It's like, when you play, it's like when you play football. If you're running down the wing and you're going to cross the ball in, you've got to not cross it into where your man is when you look. You've got to try and cross it into where you think your man's going to be by the time the ball gets there. 
that's the Coriolis effect, essentially. In football, you're both running together and you're both moving. You've got to aim your trajectory to land where he's where he's going to be by the time he gets there, right? Well, it's supposed well, to be well, the same with the Earth rotating. If you're going to aim at your target and the Earth's moving, you've got to aim where you think it's going to be by the time your bullet gets there. And it, nobody does it like that. I just pointed one thing out, though. That is correct if you take the assumption that Earth is spinning. That's not Coriolis effect that you've just detailed, though. The Coriolis effect would be the footballer looking at the ball after it's been thrown and saying, hey, you know what? That ball is travelling straight. But because I'm spinning underneath it, it looks like it's curving. That's Coriolis effect. Yeah. Not only, just... not only that. Hang on, Anthony. There's something wrong with that illustration. Uh, in football, American football, I've thrown the ball. I've been a receiver, you know, both ends, quarterback, receiver, even in soccer too, or English football. You're leading your player. You know where he's going to be. He's actually running there. The earth he's running on isn't moving. <laughs> yeah, I suppose not it's the... inverted the opposite way around. But the point I'm making is that when you've got something moving, they go over something that's not moving. You've got to calculate for that. But we never see flights being adjusted. Like I said in my video recently, you don't see planes heading towards France to get to America because by the time they get to the south, the southerly direction, America's shimmied across and scrolled across to you. It doesn't happen. They just fly to America. Well, that's my point in your ballistics and the football is if if they use your football analogy, which was weak to begin with, and I know they use it, then you got to say, great, then let's go to a rifle range and I want you to lead your target by 1,500 feet on a mile shot. Let's see how many times you hit it. I bet you everything I have, he'll never hit it. Correct. Because there is no adjustment. There is no, adju there is no apparent deflection. The only thing that affects it. bullets is a little bit of turbulence along the way, a little bit of low pressure fluctuations or a bit of wind or whatever, but there's nothing to do with anything moving because if there was, you'd never be able to hit anything. There's several things that can affect the bullet. Temperature, wind, and the, the amount of gunpowder and the velocity. And that's why they have a spotter and they've tested all these things under different wind conditions. And that's why the spotter will say, aim a little here, do a little that, because the bullet's going to be falling down as it loses speed. Yeah, Cor Coriolis is getting more and more concise in terms of how we demolish it, how we can pull it apart, and, you know, uh, hats off to Anthony, he's getting sharper and sharper in terms of his ability to debunk this, and, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Anthony, but in days gone by you've said i don't like this i just don't want to talk about it it's not my subject right now you're into it and the more people like yourself and mitchell get into it the more concise it'll become throughout this arena generally so i'm i'm very grateful because it was qe he was on his own and it was me and qe and you feel very lonely arguing this subject in the weeds for an hour and then 50 minutes, and then 40, and then 30. Over the course of about two years, it's got down to the point now where we can pull apart someone's claim in about 10 seconds. Like with Simon Dan. What's that? They're both in the same reference frame. A, no Coriolis effect then. B, that's not 15 degrees an hour of Earth turning underneath. C, you're a moron, Simon Dan. That was quick. They're on the losing side of this argument, the Globeheads. And since 2020, January 1st, Black Swan's arrival, it's all downhill from here. There was a reasonable amount of wiggle room and obfuscation opportunity prior to the Black Swan. Now there isn't. The argument is uncomplicated by this argument. You need geometry, you haven't got it. Your own rebuttal debunks your claim that we've got physical geometry blocking boats and buildings. That's the end of the Globe Earth assertion. No Earth curve. Your own side says no earth curve, can't see it. Only exists in maths. So it's just a reification fallacy. We've said it all along, but now we've proven it. So what else you got? Pictures from space? No, debunked. Gas would fill the space. Entropy law. Natural law dictates the gas would fill the space if it was a sky vacuum. What else you got? Coriolis effect. According to Simon Dan, we won't see 15 degrees an hour of earth turning underneath. He assumes earth spinning when we don't see deflection. Well, beyond his assumption that they're spinning together, again in violation of how gas behaves, gas is unbonded, not Velcroed to Earth, and north, south, and west surface winds would debunk that notion. It's not travelling with Earth. Wind isn't Velcroed. That's not how gas behaves either. So your 
assumption that they're travelling together is debunked by gas law, and your assumption debunks the claim we've got Coriolis effect, Simon Dan. So we don't have an Earth that spins. There's no Coriolis deflection to be observed. We don't have any pictures from space. The sky is not a vacuum. It stands in violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And we don't have Earth curve. We're told by the rebuttals from the globe side. We don't see Earth curve. That's it. What else? You got Earth's flat and motionless. I'll tell you, just by Rumpus coming in and having the subject be gravity, he avoided the top three, right? He avoided Earth-based Coriolis. He avoided gas pressure without containment. And he avoided the number one, black swan, no geometric physical horizon. He decided to go to a fourth one, gravity, because he can't debunk the first three with any confidence. And he thinks he could debunk gravity. And he lost miserably on the fourth one. Can you, can you imagine if he ever took on number one, black swan? Uh, he's one of the quotes. The geometric horizon only exists in the maths. That's a rumpus quote. Only exist in maths. It's supposed to be blocking boats and buildings. Here we are on screen now with what debunked their religion of a sphere Earth with their own claim that we do not see the requirement of a tangent point to a physical sphere edge that formerly blocked things in the distance. That's this point here, the tangent point, that Al Baruni said he measured to give him R. Well, now we don't see it. We don't have tangent points in geometry. We're told it's a donkey dick bent to a different point. Atmospheric refraction, which requires R. 7 over 6R is what they're telling you. Bends the light at the presupposed rate of the sphere itself, even though we cannot see the actual physical obstruction they used to say blo blocks boats and buildings. That cannot be seen. Wouldn't it be expected to be seen? Only exists in the maths. Therefore, can't be measured to give you R to bend the light at the rate of the curve you were assuming in the first instance. It's total annihilation of the globe Earth claim. The black swan has destroyed your fundy faith from within the assumption. Where you used to say, oh, of course it's okay to just automatically assume I'm stood on a sphere. Well, now you can't because we've left the mathematics untenable with the black swan. Boom! Game over globe. Downhill from here. Just a question of how long it'll take you to understand that. That'll be you fundy morons that don't get when your model's dead. Your model being a reification fallacy. A fallacy. The assumption of R being a fallacy. Begging the question. And the begging the question reification having been gone into within the mathematical properties and debunked from within by the black swan as being fundamentally impossible to have geometry in the first instance. Rebuttal from the globe side? Well, you wouldn't expect to see geometry. Meaning you wouldn't expect to see Earth curve. It only exists in maths. Earth curve only exists when we turn the world side on and exclude perspective and call it Earth curve. That's when you see Earth curve in mathematics. Yep. Hey, Anthony, you there? Yes, sir. Do you remember the very first time Rumpus came on to debate the Black Swan? You and Ranty, two and a half hours, and his final answer was, that photograph has to be a glitch in the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, I was... remember that. It was awesome. He what, ran what out was of the all... thing. What? what was the thing he was referring to when he said, um, "We no, we don't see blah, blah, blah. And then uh, literally the next sentence was, we do, we do, we do. What That's was the it? geometric horizon. We asked him if we could see the geometric horizon. He told us that we could not and would not expect to see something that only exists in maths. And then we pointed out that Al Bruni should be measuring it. He said, we do, we do see the geometric horizon. The contradiction in terms that is globe earth mathematics. You can't simultaneously be geometric, physical, capable of measurement by Al Biruni and non-physical, non-measurable, only existing in maths. That violates the law of non-contradiction. And that little gem from Rumpus was him doing precisely that. Telling you that it's both physical, capable of blocking boats and buildings, and non-physical, only existing in geometry. Good Monday show. Stay tuned if you're watching on the uh, Nathan Oakley or Nathan Oakley 1980 programming streams. There will be an after show to follow when I round out in a few minutes' time. Uh, in the meantime, if you are watching this live, I'm spamming the chat with a clown show debunking of Thunderfoot, which has been carefully edited and put together with me this morning. 
So that will premiere as soon as this live show ends, so 3 p.m. UK time. So be here or be sphere on the Nathan Oakley 1980 channel. If you're watching this on either primary stream of this particular show, then this has already gone out and will be on the playlist at the top of the Nathan Oakley 1980 channel. So check it out. It's called Thunderfoot Demonstrated Stupid at an Intermolecular Level. It'll premiere as soon as this live stream finishes. Anything anybody got to add before I do actually round out? How many microstates in that intermolecular level are there? Let's not get into those sorts of details. We need to keep it dumbed right down for Thunderfoot. Don't talk about microstates. He thinks gas behaves like solid, bonded, bouncy balls and go down with an exclusive vector as opposed to expand in all directions as per gas law. Any more for any more? No, that's about it, dude. You're supposed to give me a cliffhanger to keep people enticed should they be watching on the primary stream. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony Riley. With that, I will say a huge, massive, enormous thank you first and foremost to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in the live stream audience for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out the primary stream that's going out now on Nathan Oakley 1980, which is a debunking of the second response from Thunderfoot. Again, if you're watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley premiering streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you all in the next video. I do like Monday shows. And it was a treat to have you here, Sue, uh, Sleepy Warrior, for a change. Well, I've been busy the last week or two working on my motorbike. And um, Righteous wasn't in, so I jumped on while I could. Yeah, it's very good. I'm very, very pleased. I know you've been working on your motorbike. I've been getting visual updates with photographs and stuff. So but The <sighs> yeah, audience don't death. know that. No, no. No, no. I had a death. I had to, I had to chop a bolt in half to get it off. Fucking solid as hell. Honest to God, the first one that cracked sparked as it cracked, and that's when you know it's tight. Second one snapped my tool, so I then put a big tool on it, snapped that, and then I just thought, this is never going to come off. Took it around my mates, it rounded, and then I had to cut it off with a Dremel. So chopped it off, pulled it all apart, fixed the job I needed to do, put it all back together again, ordered new bolts, nine quid for stainless steel jobbies, and then uh, put it all back together. But in the last Two or three days, I've replaced 24, to 5 to 6. So 28 seals over three calipers on the motorbike. It took forever. <laughs> what a nightmare it is. <laughs> it's all good. Have you finished now? Are you going to start fiddling with that sub I sent you? I'm going to go and pick it up from my mum's. Um, I got it delivered to my mum's because I wasn't about for the last. I knew when you were going to send it, if it came on a certain day, I wouldn't be there to receive it. So I sent it to my Mars, and I haven't been over yet. Um, but I will be going over today to, at some point this evening to pick it up, and uh, then I'll work out how to plumb it in. But I, I will; it'll be. I'll have it this evening, and then I'll uh, be playing with it. It's a good, a good thing to fiddle with. It's very fiddle worthy because it's passive. You're not going to chance are you're not going to damage anything, and it's it's easy to just wire up to some standard amplifier. But you can fiddle it. With, you can fiddle with it. You can tune it. It's actually called an acoustic tune subwoofer, so it's designed to be fiddled with to get the right sound out of it which is true for most subwoofers, but more so with this one. So if you're particularly handy, I've, I've left one, the tube I ended up with, which I ended up having to fabricate, but I've left that in there, which is the, a fairly long tube. But you can vary the length of tube to vary the frequency response and sensitivity to match it with your front speakers, which pass through the sub, and it's very nice crossover. So you can end up really nicely matching the two and getting a really good balance. So you can you can end up with tiny little speakers with really deep bass, which just makes the whole the whole presentation sound enormous. And I know which speakers you've got, and it will sound if you if you go to the effort, it'll sound glorious.
So I thought that that sub that you sent to me, it's in a box, right? And it had um, a panel on the back. Yeah. But it's passive. Passive, yeah. Fuck, I'll have to find a way of powering that now then. Bastard, that means I've got to buy another amp. <laughs> yeah, I've got to buy Shit. another amp. I'm sure I can sort you out with an amp. I'm, get, I'm also getting um, everything goes all at the same time. I've ended up with loads of things being having money spent on them. And it's typical that things like the fridge break, when you've just spent money you haven't got, it's just sod's yeah. law. But there we go. I've sent off I sent off my amplifier, which has been bust for about five years, to be fixed to work with the new sub that I've bought, which is why you've got my old one. Um but uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to pay for that and then pay for the fridge. But I've forgotten the point of why I was telling you this now. What did you say just before that me? Amp. Oh, the amp. Yeah, the, the the amp that I'm actually using in place of the one that's out for repair and have been using for about five years. You can just have that if you want. I'll just send you a power amp. I just I, it's I, I happen to have random hi-fi just knocking around. I just happen to have a power amp. So if you happen to need some some something to make it work. I'm pretty certain you've got everything you need already, though. But we'll discuss that when we're not when we're not recording. Well, no, because this is... Yeah, we'll we'll do that when we're offline. I don't I don't mind talking about it in the after show. It's just if it was live, I would prefer not to talk about passive subwoofers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I, I've got all the amps and stuff, but I've got them all currently on stuff that they're all actually in use and being used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've sent me a new sub that has to find a new home. No, 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 no. Where you've got. What what are powering the missions at the moment? Those missions I gave you. That SMS SMSL Q five. Perfect. That so back. what you do is you run that into the back of the sub, and then you run cables yeah, I know, from. But, I know, but listen, I've already got a sub attached to that. Oh, okay. So that's what I mean. I've already got a sub on that. I've already got a sub on the computer uh, on the telly in the living room. So that's two with two subs on it. So the only one that's outstanding is the sub in the bedroom, and that needs uh, the telly in the bedroom, and that needs. A, 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 a power supply, a source. Right, that does need, yeah, you'll need an amp because you obviously can't power it off the telly. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, I've got it sussed. I'll work it out. Just got to work out how I'm going to do it now, that's all. But it's just it's just a piece of, like a jigsaw piece, isn't it? That's all. Yeah, I'd love to keep it. I think that particular sub, I've tried dozens. If, probably I've had two dozen subs in this room where I am now, um, fiddling and faffing, and none of them have ever been any good. And that particular one, because it was, you could fiddle with it. I got it to work really, really well, and I'd love to keep it, but I just don't have space. I just, physically, I don't have the space to keep some of this stuff. Now I've got two kids in in a flat. There's just not enough room. So various things, I just give them away. Often things that I'd rather keep. <laughs> but there we go. So long as they reach somebody that I know will fiddle with them, I'm like, I, I know, I'm, I'm content knowing it's it's being loved. Not that it's actually anything more than an inanimate object that's had a lot of love already. Yeah, there's not. I mean, I, I when I first saw the reverse of the panel, the panel that you sent to me, when I first glanced at it, I saw all the, the graphs, and I'm looking at it now. I've got it on screen. And it's weird, because when I first looked at it, I just instantly thought I saw something that now when I look back at it, I realized wasn't actually there. And that was inputs, in, you know, like phono inputs going in. <laughs> it's not. It's just got... It's got inputs going in, but it's not got amplified input inputs going in, has it? It's yeah, not got it's, the, it's, um, it's passive. The, exactly. The, it's not got the control. It's one of those things. It's, not it's, a, it's a that. fairly, it's a kind of really uncommon thing to have passive subs in any system, but to do high end audio file stuff, that's how you do it. You you would do it passive. Now, car audio enthusiasts do it that way. They do it the right way. But home audio, they don't. They they stick a, an amp in something that's vibrating. <laughs> it's just wrong. And I've never liked that. I mean, I've tried plenty of active subs and powered subs. There's a difference. But I won't go into that. It's boring. But the point is that, you know, that's the wrong way to do it. So the way, the way and not surprisingly, I got it to work really well, was with a passive sub. In other words, I can choose what amp. I can set all the parameters. I can set all the crossover frequencies digitally in a digital preamp. Not in some horrible shitty Chinese thing where it's got a, a potentiometer and it's just shit. You know, I want to do all that digitally and keep the signal absolutely pristine until it gets to the sub and then it just gets just moves the cone in and out. That's all I want to happen. But there we go. That's not what everyone wants. Convenience is what everyone wants. So sticking an amp in the back of a subwoofer is what everyone wants. So that's even what the high-end manufacturers do. So it took me a, a while to find something that was passive that I could actually power with a nice amp rather than some cheap, cheap, horrible digital amp that's strapped to the back of it. Do you know what's really odd? This is like proper geeky, and I don't mean it to sound this way, because I don't, 
I hate it when people say this because it's just so, ugh. But when I watch the telly in the bedroom, that's not got a dedicated sound system, right? It's just got the integrated two watt speakers in the side or whatever size they are. I can't fucking hear it. I'm listening, yeah. trying, to, trying to listen to, I don't know, Robocop or whatever. And I can't hear what's going on. It's not because I'm, uh, it's not because I'm deaf. It's just because the sound quality is so poor that it's just tinny noise. It's not, it's not sound anymore. It's like I, I've become such a, um, such a snob. Not really. It's just not being able to hear it. You're not wrong. You know, TV, just about as far removed from a speaker, a proper speaker as you can get, right? It's a horrible plastic box with a plastic cover with a load of holes in it and then some cheap, horrible, nasty speaker that's about two watts vibrating a plastic chassis. Just vile. And you know, when I noticed as well that that SMSL, that Q5 Pro that you originally sent me to, when I first bought it, it was 110 quid, right? And now you can't buy them for less than 140 quid. So what seems to have happened is that it was in its early infancy of its of its product lifespan. It's They sold it at an undervalue. And now, for whatever reason, if you want to buy more of them because they are pretty good, you have to pay more for them because they're obviously selling quite a lot of them. They're, they're popular. But the sound that comes out of them is fantastic. It's like, yeah, I, I was better. so surprised when, when this little tiny I'm surprised they put the price made. up because for another 10 quid, I, I could name another dozen different things that would be even better. But they put the price up, fair enough. Well, you got it for the right price. It's not worth 140 quid. No, I, do you know, I've actually got one, two, three. I've got three of them. I've bought three of them since because they're that good. No, I agree. I love the small, the cute form. They're, they're just too good. Just too good. I do love a good high five. It's been a great Monday. Other than having no fridge, it's been a great day. Yeah, fuck the fridge. We've got high five. <laughs> Yeah, with that, with a warm Coke, it's not quite the same. And <laughs> the, yeah. amp that, the one that the amp that I may give to you depends how it goes. Um, I don't know, I might want to keep it. It's, it's just not powerful enough to drive the sub that I've bought. So currently I've just turned it off. I don't want to destroy the sub by clipping it horribly. So uh, I've just turned it off. It's only 50 watts and the sub's about 1,000 watts. So it just doesn't even make it move. It just distorts immediately. Oh, well. It's all good. Anyway, why, why, how come you were four minutes late starting today? It's not like you to be late. I, I, did, I pressed a button and it didn't register on the stream deck. So I pressed, I was pressing lots of buttons all at once. I might have just not ac actually pressed it. Well, obviously I didn't press it correctly because it didn't start live. So I ran the advert and what I'm doing is I'm grinning at the camera, looking down the lens, which means I'm not looking at any of the screens, waiting for it to start. And then at various strategic points during the intro, I glance down at various different things. I Is my mic on? Is the stream running? I'll just have a quick glance um, for a split second. And I glance down, I'm like, oh, no green light. So then I went, oh, I've just done half an intro and, what, 45 seconds of the starting reel. And no, no show. The show's not live. <laughs> so on the recording for this show, you've got me doing half an intro and then going, oh, bollocks it's not working <laughs> i would have been on time yeah yeah every time i think of punctuality i can't help but think of patricia she's the opposite end of the, st the scale <laughs> never yeah. on time i think it's important on youtube to have a proper schedule you know i like to be punctual i like to go out to people get into a routine of knowing when the show's going to start now, yeah, there's going to be times that I'm a couple of minutes late. I've never been more than five minutes late as far as I'm concerned. That, that's just, that's, there's no excuse. Even when I've had terrible problems, I've still managed to get the show started live. I start an hour early in case there's a major problem. You know, sometimes there's really boring pre-shows for that reason. You know, if I'm sat here, I at least want to be recording some material of some description because often without realizing it, out of the blue, suddenly a really good conversation starts up. Not often the case, it's the warm-up, right? But there we go, it does occasionally happen. Um, but that means that the hour prior to, maybe it's not an hour, maybe it's 50 minutes, I'll start about 10 past 1. Um, that hour means that if the, everything balls is up, the computer crashes and OBS doesn't work, I can systematically go through the whole thing in about half an hour, 45 minutes, and just about get going live on time. I think that's really important. I agree. But yeah, Patricia, you'd be sat in a live stream, and for us Brits... Her scheduled stream time when she was doing Flat Earth videos was 11pm. So you'd be sat here at 11pm going, yeah, this is not 
true for me, but I know from other people telling me, I'd be going to bed about now. Let's wait for Patricia. 25 past 11. She'll come into the chat. Just got back from the spa. Shouldn't be too long. I'm just <laughs> yeah. going to have a shower. <laughs> You're like, what? It's it's got to midnight here. <laughs> Get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. I am one of them people that moaned about it all the time, not being on time. Because like you say, it's like it's, she's due to start at 11. We're getting ready to go to bed. And often in, in most cases are actually in bed with your phone at the next to you. And you're listening. And there's no sign of Patricia. And eventually she, she waddles up and it's like quarter to midnight and she's just starting. And it's like, Jesus Christ, I could have been asleep. <laughs> it's just the worst feeling in the world. <laughs> yeah, it ruins your following day. <laughs> hey, I tell you what was impressive over the weekend. Did you watch the Formula One? Say again. Did you watch any of the Formula One? No, I don't have a telly. Well, I watched it on YouTube. You can watch the highlights on YouTube. Do you know, it's actually got to the point now where Formula One is that superficially shallow that like the people don't even look like real people anymore. Lewis Hamilton, right? He looks like a graphic. He doesn't look like a human. So I was, I was watching um, the, the commentary or, or the highlights with the commentary on it from, um, what's it, Jake Humphrey. And uh, he was basically describing how uh, Lewis Hamilton was getting around the last, I don't know, six or eight corners with two punches. And the car was falling. It was literally disintegrating whilst he's driving around. It was brilliant. Very, like, climactic towards the end. But when he was when he was showing the um, caricature at the end, saying Lewis Hamilton, age 35, wins X, the start races, pole positions and all that, it just looked totally awkward. It didn't look like it was a real bloke. It looked like it was a CGI-created person. And I'm looking at him going, is that really what he looks like now? Because I don't remember him looking like, I've not watched Formula One for a long time, but I saw it and I was like, this doesn't even feel real anymore. That's how bad it was. It's really bad. But very very entertaining at the same time, which was a bit of a, like, you know, it was like a paradox. How can it be on the one hand, not real, and on the other hand, entertaining? But it was, his car was disintegrated towards the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a point in the, Maybe it was in the 2000s or maybe the late 90s when Schumacher was racing and Ferrari just won all the time. And it did get boring. And it's kind of like that now with Mercedes. Last time I did watch Formula One, Mercedes with the with the latest cars were just winning all the time by a considerable margin. Like no one was anywhere near them. And last time I checked, it was the same. What I do watch, I'm more interested in these days, is the, the technology and the advancements in technology the cheating that also interests me because it's i say cheating but it's like pushing the limits of the rules for yeah. the end of a season before they ban whatever it is that they've in introduced to try and get an edge it's always it, technology it's based so like it's exciting to see them quote unquote cheat yeah it's funny because on the one hand you have this technical innovation the idea of being formula one being the pinnacle edge of technology and, and, and the petrol engine and whatnot and with that comes with the design and the, the research and like put, putting all the aerofoils on the cars and all that. And that's all really impressive, right? But where do you draw the line between so-called cheating and being technically innovative to get an upper hand? Because there's nothing wrong with being technically innovative. And then they argue, well, it's something that's in the rules. And then when you look at the rules and then you have that argument, it's like, like within the community that we're in, we argue over whether it's a force or an effect or whether this or that. And it becomes really semantic because you look at what the rules say and somebody will say, this is what the rule says and this is what they've done. And they, you might as well just have climactic music in the background going dom, dom, dom. But when you look at it, you go, I don't really see how that's not technically innovative by nature because it's like it seems to be being very, very intelligent. He's got some new little bit of a device that gives him an advantage. Why is that breaking the rules? And it seems to be that there's some bloke in a, in, a, in a room somewhere that decides whether it would breach the rules or was technically innovative or not. And it's like that distinction between is it innovative or is it getting an unfair advantage? And when it becomes like, oh, well, everything's cheating, it seems to be stupid because it seems to be that you can't be technical, technologically innovative and gain the upper hand because that's seen as cheating. It's like, well, that seems to be working within the, the confines of Narnia. It's, it's only racing when it's within their confines, Narnia. It's a bit like gravity and all their arguments within their Narnia. It's like, well, the, the racing is supposed to be racing, right? It's not supposed to be within the context of the rules. I understand why the rules exist, 
But when you're arguing over whether something's illegal or not, why can't you argue whether it's technologically innovative instead and make it more interesting? Because we want to see what's really going on. What is this gain that they're getting? What is it? What's it doing? Is it? In, uh, and, uh, it just becomes all about the rule rather than the race in itself. It's embarrassing. Yeah. It's just so superficially shallow at the moment. It's unreal. Yeah, but as I say, I, I do like the technology. I was, I was chatting about it um, with Neo. I think Neo, the one, one of one of my patrons and channel members, and he was talking about uh, an AMG Merc that he's got. It's like a two liter four pot, but it's like four hundred and fifty horsepower from a from a four cylinder engine. Now. On the one hand, I think it's just wrong. 50 grand for a four pop. It's just wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? On the other hand, I think, wow, that is amazing. How far they've pushed combustion engines. It's just astonishing. Yeah. I remember when Saab brought out that Aero 93. And at the time, front wheel drive, I remember, I think it was Jeremy Clarkson or somebody off Top Gear. He was quoted on the record as saying that the Saab engineer that made the car said the actual limit of a front-wheel drive car maximum is 200 brake horsepower. You can't get a car more powerful than that because it's, it's too much strain on the chassis and all that. And the Saabs were known for snapping various parts of the, the suspension linkage and the chassis and other parts that shouldn't be snapping and whatnot. But now it's like they've gone past 200 uh, brake horsepower and they're getting up to 300 brake horsepower because they're putting big turbos on small displacement cars. And I'm like, this is crazy. It's like, it's, I'm so out of touch with modern cars. I feel as though society's ran ahead of me and I've just been left behind. It's, it's bad. Yeah, there's a lot more to break on them, though. What and you do? have to pay a fortune to get them repaired. And I mean, you can't change a headlight bulb on the average Audi without taking the bumper off and the headlight out, or both, or one or both. Yeah. But in the olden days with a Fiesta, it was undo the bonnet or unpinch the bonnet, take the rubber grommet off, one clip that little fiddly clip that snaps and whatever hurts your fingers, take your bulb out, put your new bulb in, and away you go. Can't do that anymore. You've got to take it to the dealer. Often you've got to plug the computer in as well to tell, and you can't all, most of the time, you can't change one bulb. You've got to change them both. Stupid. And it's hundreds. Well, at the Hoovies Garage made a really interesting point with an old Audi. So he took an old Audi A6 all road, and the all six was a air suspended modernized a6 that you could lift up higher to sort of compete with uh, the four wheel drives that had come out at the time and it did terribly well initially and then got more and more unreliable as time went but went by and eventually he's now got a reputation for being a really really unreliable car but as he looked around it is like pointing out that all of the technology that's now bust and broken and cost too much to repair for an owner that had an, uh, a car that would be, you know, worth less than the repair of something like air suspension, y you end up with it getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But all of the modern cars that are coming out now have all got that sort of technology on them as, as like a base standard. So they're all yeah. going to be just as crap. They're all going to fare just as well in five, ten years' time compared to sort of older fashion bog-standard suspension and bog-standard steering and, you know, just more basic cars will just fare better in time than something like that Audi or a modern Beamer or a modern Merc, which are all on air suspension and have a million different computers running them. Well, they're just going to break. As soon as that gets down the end of its lease life and into owners proper owners' hands and you end up with a five grand repair bill on something like air suspension it's just not going to get done it's going to end up with yeah. a lot of like iphones disposable bmws it's heartbreaking to me i agree completely they've gone to the point where they don't want these things being repaired unless you take it back to them i mean you go to the average i mean my next door neighbor he said to me the other day he said do you know what he said this bloody audi he's got an audi a 59 plate audi and it's a silver one typically silver i think it's the a4 might be wrong doesn't matter and all he needs is a headlamp bulb, right? But he can't get one headlamp bulb because if he plugs that one one in it, that's worn brand new compared to the other one that's in it that's somewhere in its life. Um, and it, basically, to get this thing done, right, he's got to buy two of them, he's got to fit two of them, and then put it on a computer to tell them that it's had two new bulbs in, in right? But to get it fitted, he's got to get the bumper off to be able to get the headlight out. And I said, what? That's just ridiculous. And the only way you can realistically do it is take it back to the dealer because they've got the computer to plug it in. The average Joe Blog mechanic with a 13mm spanner can't get to it anymore. It doesn't work. It's just yeah. stupid. 
It's the same on my wife's Audi. It's got igniters, so they're called, on the headlights. And once they go, it's time for a complete new headlight assembly from Audi. 1300 quid for one headlight. So when the igniter went on one of them, I'm like, no. <laughs> so I went to a scrapyard and found one. They wanted 300 quid for one that was full of flies. I'm like, well, it's going to fail the MOT if I don't do it. So it ended up with a headlight full of flies that had a working igniter that cost as much as a, an entire pair of headlights aftermarket for most normal cars for a second-hand one for an Audi. I, I've got to ask myself, how is it the case that this is even acceptable in the society that we live in when we're supposed to be looking after recycling? How many people would scrap cars because, like, basically superficial failings, mechanical failings that are superficial, that should be, could be, and usually are, straightforward to repair by, by the average Joe Blogs or even a keen ind- independent, like, um, like mechanic that's, you know, these cars are getting scrapped just because it's just economically un- unwise to repair it because the next thing that goes is going to be very expensive. How are we in this situation these days? It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it's nuts. I've said this many times. I hate that middle ground category. I like things to be disposable. Actually throw it away because you've used it a few times and it's broken and you don't care. Or other end of the scale, worthy of repair. Therefore, when it comes to a repair bill, it's not going to exceed the cost of the item. So the fridge that I'm moaning about because it's set on fire, the repair bill will probably be a couple of hundred pounds but because it's a thousand pound fridge, or I think I paid about seven hundred and fifty pounds for it, it's just about worthy of repair. Now, the first thing Tenth Man said to me is, "Why, why don't you just go and buy a new one?" Because most people's fridges are hundred and fifty pounds or two hundred pounds, maybe. You know, therefore, five years. Oh, it's blown up. Oh, I'll just get a new one. What do you, what do you mean, get a new one? It's an enormous, great big thing. So you're just going to chuck that on the scrap heap? Yeah, it's only hundred and fifty quid. Like, no, I'd rather pay hundred and fifty quid buy a circuit board. And have it work again, probably for another five years. That's what I did with my screen. I've got a 34-inch ultra-wide screen, paid about 700 quid for it. I didn't want to get rid of it when it's when it, when it stopped working. So I rang LG up and I asked them, what, how do I get these things fixed? And they gave me a fixed price. They come and pick it, picked it up, took it away, fixed it, brought it me back. And I think it was 150 or 160 quid or whatever it was. Um, and it's guaranteed for another 12 months. And I'm like... Do you know what? That's better than going buying another screen that is going to be about 500 quid. Why dispose of it when I've already paid once for it? Just get it repaired. And then, but obviously, you have to have the money to get it repaired, but it's added out. You go and buy a new one, 500 quid. Well, you're not going to do that when you've already paid once for a screen. You just, you just got to get it fixed. But yeah, you're right. When you go beyond that point where it's disposable and it becomes that intermediate ground, you, you're reluctant to, to get rid of it. But on this monitor, yeah, it's got it repaired and it works lovely yeah excellent love it there's various things that you can't help fitting in that category like iPhones or pro- projectors for me projectors are cheap now they're not cheap they cost a thousand pounds each that's typically how much each of the projectors that I've had have, has cost and I've had dozens of them because they don't last very long you know they're getting very very hot and things in them warp and then they break now, you can't repair them. I've tried. I have actually repaired successfully a few projectors, but they don't last very long after you've repaired them. they essentially time to chuck them in the bin. Worthless pieces of crap. Well, when they're so expensive, that's heartbreaking, but you kind of accept it. That's the trade-off. Now, even if you bought one for 20 grand, it would be exactly the same. You know, it'd be out of date and broken in two or three years after you bought it. That's just the way it goes. Same with an iPhone. You just accept. If I want the most recent technology... It's only the most recent technology while it's the most recent technology. And it will be out of date. And the manufacturer doesn't want you to have something that's out of date. So they'll cobble the thing. And it'll get worse and worse and worse until you're kind of forced to buy a new one. And what happens to the old one? That's perfectly functional. Does exactly or should do exactly the same thing it did when you bought it. Well, it's worthy of the bin. Because it's not worth any money. So you chuck a thousand pound item in the bin. And that to me is criminal. It's terrible. You should be able to fix things like that. But there we go. That's not the society without, we live in. I totally agree fortune. with that. I totally agree. I'm like without a... it costing a fortune as well. But I don't mind the costing a fortune to fix things. You know, if if something's got a reasonable value to it and it's gonna take somebody time, effort, uh 
experience and parts to fix it. The fact that the part might cost five pounds and the end bill is a hundred pounds, I've got no issue with that. It's like it's not about parts. Most of it's about the understanding and experience. The fridge guy is like, well, if it's just that board, why don't you order it? I'm like, because if I order it, plug it in, and it doesn't work. I've that my experience then runs out. Therefore, you're worth 120 quid to come out, and you know, on top of the cost of the board, for you to go, hmm, it didn't work. I wonder if this is the problem. You know what I mean? I don't have that for a fridge, so it's worth paying him for his experience, and I'm happy to do that. Plus, doing that keeps that man in a job. Well, would I rather keep some massive manufacturer in business when they're just selling crap that I'm going to have to replace five years down the line? Or give a guy who can actually make that thing extend its life a little bit longer? I'd rather give him my money. Much, much, much prefer to give him my money. Yeah. Totally. Uh, skill and expertise over mass production waste. That's a good principle. What do we talk about now then? I was going to say this feels like a Friday afternoon show. Nothing sod all to do with Flat Earth. Zero debate from anybody who's been sat listening. Hi-fi, cars, <laughs> trade standards. <laughs> yeah, it's shocking. I was sat watching my... Th well, kind of sat monitoring the uh, Thunderfoot demonstrated stupid at the intermolecular level video while this was going out, so it was primarily while this stream was being recorded. Where is everyone, by the way? Where's Tenth Man? Tenth Man just dropped a second ago. Did you know that you... Go on, Steve. Did you know that you... Did you know that you didn't get... Did I know that I didn't get what? Uh, transferred to the other room, the after show room. It's because nobody. Yeah, I, I don't know how to ahead. do that. I, I, I am l so ignorant of how Discord works, so I, I don't know how to do that. Let me go. I'll go look. I'll go find somebody. Fair I could do it. I think you have to got... move everybody into the oh. after show. I've never tried it before, but I'm sure that I can do it if yeah, I got a... the. Uh... The There's a command you have to type in. I don't know what that command is. There's a specific code command that you type into Discord and it moves everybody. Don't, don't oh. fiddle with it if you don't know how to do it. I'm just going to try some. Well, what does this out. button do? No, just... What does this button do? Boom! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can move everybody over one by one. I just got in here, if you like. Sure. Are you a mod now, Travis? Uh, yeah, I've been a mod for a while now. I was going to say, it's about bloody time. I remember ages ago when you weren't a mod. I'm like, why are you a mod? You're the, one of the first people I'd have made a mod. But there we go. Oh, cheers. I'll take care of it. I I'm not fussed either way. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Unless Arwen okay. beats me to it. Between the two, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you can but manually can move them, then thing. great. Did I just get spoke to then? Sorry. Just get what? I thought I might have been... There was a silence. I thought I might have missed something. It's just that you and Arwen both spoke over each other at the same time. Oh, right. I think everyone's just been moved to the after show room. Normally Righteous Force is here doing it. I know he's your favourite person in the whole wide world, isn't he, Anthony? Yeah, I love the way he mods just the flat earthers and lets the uh, ball earthers get away with the scummiest behaviour in the world ever. And how dare anybody question him if he ever, uh, if you ever bring it to their attention that he's doing something dodgy. Okay, oh, we get it. We're being moved. Everyone's coming in. Except one. Because I'm in there. Man, by the way, is it uh, has the weather turned dramatically over here as well? Because it's like raining and pouring here. That's nice here. Hmm. 
Okay, then you'll go. get a shitty weather in the evening, probably. That, thank you, Discord mods. That's all right. We we really like doing it. No, I'm I'm grateful for your help. Are there any ballers in there? Besides Rompers, who is not in there? Rompers in there either. I moved into Bible conversation. <laughs> Bible conversation. <laughs> yeah. He's still in there on deaf and mute. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna rebring that up actually, Anthony. I, I, I didn't say this when you discussed it with me before the show, but I see him as surplus to requirements. And I know you already said, "Oh well, I just wanted to see how quick he'd get kicked." But in all honesty, we did. You, in the back of your mind, did you hope that he'd have some rebuttal to gas pressure without a container in defence of Thunderfoot? I wanted him to. I wanted him to address the gas goddamn go boom boom point because if um, what's his, Thunderfoot is claiming gas goddamn go boom boom, and Rumpus's position is that gas does not go down go boom boom, then he's in direct conflict with Thunderfoot. I wanted to hear how he addressed that specific point, but we never we never really got to it. Well, we did. He said it's got weight. He's saying it goes down because yeah. it's got weight, i.e. a single vector downward utilisation of gravity. And when I said, well, how are you going to weigh gas? Well, on the scale. Well, will that require a container? Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't drawn together with Thunderfoot's point, so that in the absence of it being directly related to or, or in reference to Thunderfoot, we didn't get closure on the point from whether or not Thunderfoot is correct. Because um, do you remember when? Do you remember when this came up originally about two years ago, uh, when Rumpus came in and he drew on on, on his thing, and, and he, I think we were talking about the egg at the time, and um, I asked him at the time point blank. I said, "What happens when we have the vacuum chamber and we put gas in it? Does it pool on the floor or does it fill the the available volume?" Because at that time in the conversation we were quite new to what was going on in terms of that particular topic. And I didn't know what happened. And I remember speaking to you about it and I said, well, how do we know either way? Um, and at the time we didn't know either way. We had to do a bit more research, but I remember Rumpus's que uh, answer being, it fills the volume. And I was like, all oh, right. Cause I thought it had pooled on the floor because the, 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 the gas molecules had more density to them than the medium of zero. Therefore they're going to fall on the floor. But I didn't realize that gas behavior was based on velocity and therefore bouncing off all the walls at all times in all directions evenly, bouncing continuously in high velocity. So I always assumed that the gas particles, based on their mass, would pool on the floor. That's what I thought would happen. But it's only as the conversation gets further into it and you see people making points and then demonstrations and you realize that it does actually fill the container. That's when the conversation gets interesting because it progresses. But I remember him distinctly. He had like this purple egg on the on the screen. Do you remember him doing it, Nathan? Yeah, of course. When it's convenient, they will assert natural law as it's dictated in the natural law. When it's not convenient and they need gas to be s staying on a ball earth in a vacuum without dispersing as per the natural law, they'll claim it has weight, a single downward vector, in complete contradiction of what they've formally claimed. Right. And, and mathematically, you can't even define gas pressure thanks to Boyle's law, which has a starting start out point of a container in order to calculate the forces and how it would function in reality. So yeah, you literally can't even theoretically have gas pressure without a container. Exactly. Where'd you get the gas pressure in the first place? Even gravity couldn't hold gas pressure in, could it? In full effect? Even if it did nope. exist? Nope. No. Because it's that's why I asked Rumpus to show us. I was like, don't give us a description of how you say it can occur. Show us. If you say gravity, show us gravity maintaining gas pressure without a container. They won't. They Please can't. It stands in violation of natural law and gravity is not a force. Even if it was a force, the force that they assert in Newtonian terms wouldn't defy entropy. The only question that's outstanding in that whole gas pressure argument is when you look at high altitude balloon footage looking down on Earth, you see like you see the gas, you see the, the clouds, you see the, the, the environment that we live. And we know that it does gradient into almost nothing. Why does it pool on the floor? 
why does it do that? That's the question. Relative density. That's yeah, but well, gas pressure doesn't do that. Does it? Gas fills the available volume. Yeah, so whatever it, the volume is yeah. that gives you the gas pressure. No, in the it, hold it, on. It, you it, just it. said there is a gradient. No. Oh, God. So it doesn't fill up everything. Yes, and it can does. you show a gradient it in a container? Everything and then as a secondary after it has filled yeah. the container I was, volume. I wasn't asking you uh, uh, gradient to have before. a gradient. Gradient is always has to secondary. Be contained first. Right, so please show a gradient in a container. Yeah. Well, we can demonstrate a gradient in a container. That's easily yeah. done. Um, because if there wasn't a gradient in the container, in any Please container, do it then. When I, well, when I did the egg test, right, if there was no gradient, the egg would either sink or float and it wouldn't be anywhere in the middle. But it, it was in the middle, so that demonstrates that there is a, a gradient, right? Now that demonstrates buoyancy. What do you mean when you say buoyancy? Buoyancy depends on gravity exactly being a force. What it says. Buoyancy. Listen. We know gravity is not a force, and buoyancy depends on gravity being a force. So when the egg is in the middle and it's neither moving up nor down, it's sat suspended in the medium. That isn't demonstrating buoyancy. Well, it's not demonstrating a gradient either, isn't it? Please show a gas gradient in a container because that's what you claimed. You're talking yeah. about water and eggs. Hill Billy Blue Balls demonstrated different. a gas pressure gradient in a container. Yeah, photosynthetic retard, blue marble science, redneck retard. He showed that. Go and check it out. Do you know which video I mean? Yeah, but it's it your question without so a container. So please show it. Sorry. Please show it. So reassert your question. Totally ignore that one of your own under the title gas pressure without a container showed a gas pressure gradient in a container as you have requested. You would require a container to have gas pressure in the first instance to have a gas pressure gradient being the point, not you repeating that we need to show it ourselves because it's our claim. It's not our claim, it's inviolable natural law. No, it's your claim. It's inviolable natural law, the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy law dictates that without the container, there can be no pressure. But it applies to Earth. Yeah, it applies to Earth. It's a natural law. Right, so please... Yeah, right. So without the container, there can be no pressure. Not right while well, move on to something else. So, right, the sky vacuum's fake. Space is fake. You can't have gas pressure without a container. That stands in violation of natural law. You just said two completely different things, but... No, I didn't. I said without the container, there can be no pressure. If the sky was a vacuum, then the gas we breathe would fill the space as dictated by natural law, inviolable natural law, not a claim I'm making, and well-established law of nature. Right, so please right. demonstrate. Right, so the gas would fill the space. Right, space is fake. Right, no further requirements from me, an acknowledgement from you that your fucking sky vacuum's fake. If space is fake... Not a question about if space is fake. Space is fake. Natural law debunks the sky vacuum. No, it doesn't. You have... uh, sorry, that's a hand wave. Yeah, it does. You don't understand entropy. You're a moron. We already established that. When you debunked Al Biruni... Yeah, I'll be trimming that out for tomorrow's video. You debunking Al Biruni... You haven't got a clue what entropy is. Don't tell me no, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Natural law debunks out of space. Second law of thermodynamics specifically. The entropy law. Gas filling the space it has available to it. That's entropy. Debunking space. But you gas said you have the container. Yeah, you would need a container to have gas pressure. That's correct. Then why would a... Why are you asking me something? Your Earth in a sky vacuum doesn't have a container. So why aren't you acknowledging that your sky vacuum nonsense is debunked by this natural law? Why is it you've got a question for me rather than an acknowledgement that your sky vacuum's dead? Oh, you muted Discord, I get it. No, I didn't! Why is it that every time I make a pummeling of this dick, 
and him saying, yeah, but, and then asking me something. He claims that I've got Discord muted. What would happen if I had Discord muted? Yeah, because that's what Because you you're going to constantly interrupt me now because he's recognised that I just am impermeable. Is I am going to fucking mute you, you twat. That's your cue to start talking through every pummeling I display here and going meow, 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 I'm being muted. What that means is I'm going to now talk through every word. Right, Ed? You may respond. I think he's called Thick Ed now. Yeah, nobody cares, Arwin. So yeah, that's your you response. Nobody to... cares, Arwin. Good. That's your response, over. You're back on mute now, Ed. I'll tell you when I mute you, you dipshit. You don't understand entropy. Do you understand what a microstate is, Ed? Let's see if we can have a decent discourse back and forth. What's a microstate? So why do you need the container? If... Sorry. It seems this conversation's over and it's only Ed's question to me. No acknowledgement that space is fake, by way of natural law. No answer to my question about what an entropy descriptive state called a microstate is. He's ignored that. Moving back onto a question for me. No, space is fake. But you'll never actually acknowledge that because you'd be ripped to shreds by your own side, Ed. Yeah, so you still didn't answer me why you need to... Continue. So it's always going to be what I have to answer to you. No, entropy is real. It debunks out of space. It's not just moving on to your question until we get an acknowledgement. Entropy dictates it. You've only hand-waved it, Ed. No, it wouldn't. And then a question for me. Yeah, it would. No, that's not what I said. Oh, that's not what I said. This is the best you've got, Ed. You haven't got any response to the violation of natural law that is a sky vacuum. You don't have anything to respond to that with. You're pathetic. Right, so why we need to contest? So, a uh, question for me. Why? Question, question. No. Sky vacuum, fake. C can I ask at some point? Right, so why need to contest? So you're going to ask me a question rather than acknowledge that you've been defeated. You don't have any response to the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increase, microstates, all of these things yes, that I are do. laid down but by natural law. All Ed has got is to talk through me like he's just done. Not listen to this concise demolition that he's not responding to and not acknowledging. He's merely moving on to his question to me. No, I'm not going to let you, Ed. No, no, I need you to acknowledge it, Ed, because you've been defeated here. Do you have a rebuttal? Can you violate the natural law that is the second law of thermodynamics, Ed? Because that's what's demolished your argument that space is real. You going to respond to that? Well, you Which, did it yourself, didn't you? What you I did, yeah. I, de I debunked space. That's correct, Ed. I did it with a natural law. That's right. I did do that, yes. But there's the container, so who doesn't... The container that's required to have gas pressure. So you understand that <laughs> the whole idea of an open system next to a vacuum as per globe Earth is fake, not real, because you need a container. You understand that then, Ed. Seems you're not acknowledging me and still asking me questions. So which one is it? So it is a question for me then. So you understand you need containment, Ed. You don't seem to be acknowledging a single demolition of your religion. Just moving on to questions for me every time. Pathetic. Right, because this is a show about Flat Earth and I have questions. Oh, well, I've got questions about the generalised Western worldview that we've got a sky vacuum above our head when natural law dictates that the sky vacuum would be filled by the gas we're breathing, leaving us with no gas to breathe. I know that you want to move on to asking us questions about straw men that you hold in absolute cold stone faith that we have by way of your baseless assertion that you'll now make with a question attached that doesn't acknowledge your fake sky vacuum. Outer space is fake, Ed. I'd like you to make some sort of acknowledgement that you'd require containment to be breathing right now. Why do we need containment? If uh, because without the container, I'll give you a quote from your own side, Ed. Conspiracy Cats 2019. Why would we need a container? Quote, Conspiracy Cats. Without the container, there can be no pressure. End quote, Ed. That's Conspiracy Cats 2019. Does that answer your question about why we'd need a container, Ed? Given that your sky vacuum belief doesn't yeah. have containment around Earth, and we'd need that to have gas pressure. 
Does that answer your question? It also destroys your faith in a sky vacuum, by the way. This natural law, and quote from Conspiracy Cats, in requirement of a containment to have gas pressure, Ed. That's why. It's an antecedent to have gas pressure. Without so the container, there can be no pressure. There's no vacuum. Yeah, that's right. There's no vacuum. That's right. Outer space is fake, Ed. Welcome <laughs> to flat Earth. That's right. No sky vacuum. Yeah. Then why do we need... Then why are you asking me a question rather than acknowledging that every word ever uttered by NASA about the sky vacuum out of space is fake? You think it's just a question for me? Yes, because there's... No, but you just need to acknowledge that space is fake. Not, yes, but I'm going to ask a question of you. No, mate. We've all been deceived, haven't we? You are still deceived, Ed. Or do you now acknowledge we'd need containment to be breathing? You didn't hear what I said just now, did you? Yeah, we don't uh, yeah care I did hear what... what you said. Yeah. You want to move on to a question for me, and I'm asking you why you're not ever giving an acknowledgement. I know why you're not acknowledging this argument, Ed, why we're still stuck here in this perpetual circle jerk with you wanting to move on and worming and wriggling like a little slug. It's because if you ever acknowledge for one second that without the container there can be no pressure, like conspiracy cats quoted, then you'd be open to the most horrendous ridicule from the globe earth side of the argument. So it's imperative that you don't acknowledge this. Now, I'm just fucking with you. I find it very amusing that no matter what happens or how many times I get to teabag you, pointing out that entropy debunks out of space, you'll give a tacit acceptance of that with a question to me, but never really acknowledge it. And that's because you're scared of your own side. Yeah, that's a nice projection, buddy. I'm not scared of your side. I'm here opening my doors to you wankers every day. You think I'm scared of you? <laughs> I am absolutely pummeling the globe. You think I'm fearful of you? No, no you're you not. You have got to be joking. Then answer the question. Uh, okay. Yeah, without the container, there can be no pressure. Yeah, we'd need containment. You're right, Ed. Space is fake. Yeah, there is no sky vacuum. How's that for an answer? If there's no vacuum, why do we... If there's no vacuum, then so you why? acknowledge there's no vacuum, outer space is fake then. Not a question phrasing. If there's no vacuum, so you understand that space is fake, there is no sky vacuum. Don't phrase it as a question, you just need to say yes, you pathetic toad. Then why do we need to... So it's a question. If the sky isn't a vacuum... Yeah, that's right, it's not a vacuum, Ed. Why aren't you acknowledging this? It seems really weaselly and pathetic. He's asking, why do we need a container? Well, because it's natural law. I already explained that to you. He's deaf. Maybe he was talking through no, me. Did you, did you have the... Dis did you, were you fundy muting me when I said the quote from Conspiracy Cats in answer to that question? I've said it three times. So I'll give it you for a fourth time. Oh, he's muting me. Fundy muting me. I'm answering his question, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, he feels the need to talk through me. What a shock. No, Ed, I answered that question with a quote from Conspiracy Cats. Quote, Conspiracy Cats 2019. Without the container, there can be no pressure. End quote. That's why we must have a container, Ed. It's an antecedent consequent relationship. Like Conspiracy Cats explains, he's explaining that the necessary antecedent to have gas pressure is a container to press upon. Quote, without the container, there can be no pressure, Ed. Fifth time, you fuckwit. Are you deaf or just a globe-believing retard with a sky vacuum belief that's only ever conceded by way of a question about if... There wasn't a sky vacuum. No, there definitely isn't. Natural law debunked it. No, it doesn't because... Oh, hand wave. Yeah, it does. The sky vacuum's debunked by entropy because if the sky was a vacuum, the gas we're breathing would fill the space. Sir. 
Uh, yeah, you didn't hear a word I just said. Did you? Yeah, you said no, it didn't. Your hand wave dismissed entropy. Have you debunked? No, the I actually explained why, but you muted Discord again. No, I'm not muting anything, dipshit. I'm telling you that entropy law is not going to be violated by some bullshit that you make up whilst talking through me. I'm curious that you didn't hear my explanation. Yeah, because every time you talk, you think that you can give an answer that you'll claim you've won with whilst talking through me. No, it wasn't. Show me gas pressure without a container. Without pointing at your fundy belief in a sky vacuum. Or how about calculating gas pressure? How do you calculate gas pressure? Yeah, I'm talking to Nathan Arwin. How do you do that? If you would have to calculate gas pressure, how are you going to calculate it? Yeah, right. So, Nathan. Your, yeah, um, he's not going to answer you, Arwin. He's going to ignore you. So, Arwin, is, do you would your point be, Arwin? Arwin, is your point that part of that equation is going to have a surface area? Well, it's going to have a volume, but a volume of what? Well, a volume on, of the let's container. Get let's get him to answer. How right, do you right. calculate gas pressure? Talking to you, you fuckwit moron, globe-believing retard. That's you, Ed, you fucking dipshit. How'd you calculate gas pressure, you fucking moron, with your hand waves and claims that you've debunked this whilst talking through me and then claiming that you're being muted as you fundy mute me by talking through me? You've got nothing, you stupid shithead globe head. Share your pain. No, no, no. Teabag the globe head, not share my pain. Projecting how badly you're losing onto me isn't going to be a win, you fuckwit. How do you cal calculate that gas pressure, fuckwit? Molecules colliding. Speak up, can't you? You're you mumbling. You're mumbling, stuttering, fuckwit clown. What's the equation, fuckwit? Uh. Yo! Fuckwit moron with a globe belief. We're asking you how you calculate gas pressure, you unbelievable dipshit. Wow, you really wanted to... Yeah, fuck it! You want to add on me? I'm teabagging you. Well, to be more accurate, Arwin's teabagging you with a simple question about how you calculate gas pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that your response, Ed? You can't teabag an Ed. Coherent. No Sorry, coherent is this it now? Your analysis of my insult... Based on your stupidity and lack of an answer here for Arwin's question, you just burst out laughing. Mate, what's happening here is flat earthers are absolutely beating the living shit out of you with your crap argument. Your argument requires the necessary antecedent of a container. It's dictated to you by natural law. In this case, Arwin's going to go to Boyle's law and teabag you with that. You stupid retard. Now, if you want to sit here and laugh claim and claim whilst talking through me that you've somehow won or project your own loss onto us, that's fine, mate. But it doesn't change the circumstances. Space is fake because we wouldn't be breathing if it was real. You've got nothing, Ed. But you claim the container. Yeah. Yeah. So we're back into this circle, Jerk. It's the last time. I'll give it for the audience, but Ed's getting removed. I've said it to him six times, and I'll say it for the audience now. I've removed him. Quote, conspiracy cats. Without the container, there can be no pressure. He keeps asking me why we'd need a container and ignoring the quote from his own side that's perfectly in line with all of the laws relating to gas. So ideal gas Ed law, is... Boyle's law, the second law of thermodynamics, all of these would require containment to have gas pressure in the first place. These are natural laws. And in response to a quote from his own side that makes that explicitly clear, he'll just ask the same question, why do we need a container five times? So I feel, I feel perfectly justified in kicking his dumb ass, ass, his dumb ass out. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's an F. An F minus. <laughs> Ed doesn't know gas. He doesn't get it at all. This is how Thunderfoot would get on. What, why the container after all this? Then he doesn't have the slightest clue what gas is. Not the slightest. Yeah, I was going to say it's comparable to the Thunderfoot nonsense. Just describe it as being bouncy balls falling through gas. 
and then it'll go down, go boom, boom, with a single vector. Like if I could put it on a scale, if I had a massive container around the gas. Yeah, you need gas pressure without a container to be in line with your fundamentalist religious zealot belief that the sky is a vacuum with burning balls of gas also in violation of natural law. And if your only assertion to back that bullshit is to beg the question of gravity and use a solid to demonstrate it, then you're going to have your ass handed to you by flat earthers. We are going to continually humiliate you with your nonsense that you're spewing because of your globe faith. Any more for any more Sleeping Warrior Owen or anyone in Discord? Um, just let it be known that when he was asked by Arwen, a dumb flat earther, how do you calculate gas pressure? He wasn't able to even give an answer. That's because he probably doesn't know. He doesn't realise that it's pummeling his argument. He'll just ask why you need containment, having been given six quotes from his own side and three different gas laws and how they're applicable. It wouldn't matter if we showed him a demonstration with a balloon. It makes no difference to these morons. They're still going to cling so tightly to the heliocentric religious worldview where they know that heaven's a vacuum because they're more on religious fundies right i think i'll round out with that unless anybody else got anything to add any more for any more nah man with that i'll say a huge massive enormous thank you to both discord and g plus panels for making today's after show possible and of course a massive thank you to all of you in either nathan oakley 1980 or nathan oakley premiering streams for hopefully smashing the super chat liking commenting sharing subscribing and all that good stuff if you wanted to watch this early you can become a nathan oakley 1980 channel member as these shows go out immediately after they've been recorded i've been nathan oakley and i'll see you all in the next video Day.